Western one of the most thrilling episodes, dangers lurked everywhere around Vimisha. She was attacked by the killer giants, but her friend Sheil intervened to fend them off. However, he fell into the river, making the situation even more dire for Vimisha. Eventually, she was captured by these monsters. Will Vimisha survive this attack? Follow the story to its conclusion to find out everything. On a dark night in a forest, with Vimisha fleeing from the men of her village who are determined to kill her. They see her as a potential disaster because she lacks stars in her magical abilities. The villagers believe that those without stars shouldn't exist in their world. Vimisha continues running through the forest until sunrise, where she stops at a particular spot marked with symbols on a tree. She opens a hidden door in the forest floor, revealing a small underground space filled with bags. These bags were given to her by a witch, possessing magical powers that allow anyone to store items of any size in them. Vimisha puts various things in the bags, including magical books and poison bottles. She wears the bags and sets off to escape haunted by the memories of being an unwanted child and rejected by the village. As hours pass and the sun rises on a beautiful day, Vimisha finds herself in a lush green forest. She plays around expressing her desire to have skills like running, hiding, and escaping. However, she realizes that having such skills wouldn't have changed her fate. Should her past life advises her to stop complaining and accept her circumstances if she wants to achieve something in life. Vimisha decides to become strong and continues playing until she stumbles upon a landfill sparking her excitement to explore its contents. In this place, Vimisha finds many things, including numerous poison bottles and clothes in good condition. She discovers a map inside one of the clothes, bringing her great joy as it will make her journey easier. She gathers all these items and puts them in her bag. However, Vimisha is reminded once again that she is an unwanted child and no one desires her anymore. This realization saddens her deeply. Suddenly, she senses the presence of people in the vicinity. She hides and observes two individuals searching for her. One of them mentions that it's the perfect time to feed the gelatinous creatures. Vimisha wonders if these creatures are cute but senses that they are not. She overhears the men discussing her, highlighting that her only problem is figuring out which direction she escaped to. Upon hearing this, Vimisha quickly flees the area to avoid being seen, as they are still searching for her. While hiding among the trees, Vemishai hears the men talking about the village leader creating a commotion regarding her, offering a substantial reward for anyone who brings her head, regardless of whether she's alive or dead. This revelation distresses Vimisha, knowing that the village leader intends to kill her as well. She runs away from them until night falls, eventually finding refuge under a massive tree where she sleeps. The next morning, Vimisha wakes up and explores the forest. She walks by a beautiful lake and experiences a gust of wind, stirring up many gelatinous creatures in her direction. And Slikinch, she runs away and suddenly stumbles upon a distant location. Relieved to have escaped the gelatinous creatures, Vimisha discovers a wound on her hand. She applies the old poison bottle to it but realizes it's not enough. Fortunately, another bottle appears, and she successfully heals her wound. Afterwards, Vimisha continues her journey and finds the beautiful lake again. Overcome with a sense of wonder, she decides to undress and swim in it, feeling a wonderful sensation she had never experienced before. She recalls the advice of the witch to be strong and determined, prompting her to cut her hair and disguise herself as a boy to travel safely. She chooses the name Ivy to replace the name given to her by her father, symbolizing resilience like the plant that grows even if stepped on. As Ivy, she contemplates her uncertain future, realizing that everyone else in life has goals, unlike afterward, Ivy explores the forest and senses something within it. She looks at the flowers and finds a small gelatinous creature standing on one of them. Ivy searches for it in the book she carries and discovers that it's not part of the known monster species. It's a rare, unnamed gelatinous creature. She decides to give it a name and continues reading, finding out that it's called the frail gel or the dispersing gel. Ivy understands that it is indeed weak, just like her, but she doesn't want to label it as weak. She decides to observe it with a different name. As the wind blows, the gelatinous creature floats with it due to its extreme weakness. It eventually falls on its back, unable to get up. Ivy realizes that it is exceptionally fragile, and the book confirms that it might disappear with a simple touch or vanish if a strong storm blows. A concern for the frail gel, Ivy rushes to rescue it, fearing that strong winds might make it vanish. She manages to save it before it perishes. As the sun sets, Ivy talks to the frail gal, expressing her frustration about the unfairness of life. She explains the system in their village, where people receive their skills at the age of five, and the number of stars determines the skill's strength. Jo Cobwister, Ivy reveals her own past, having received a skill called Monster Taming with no stars. 
She shares her inability to even tame small animals due to the lack of stars, and when everyone discovered her starless skill, their attitudes towards her changed, including her parents. Evie sadly recounts the loss of her home, family, and everything she once had. But she finds solace in the fact that she still possesses memories of her past life. She mentions that she's a human reborn in a different world and carries memories that, unfortunately, are not useful in her current situation. Sometimes, these memories whisper things she can't comprehend in her ear. Then Avi falls silent for a moment and tells him that another person treated her kindly and she is a sorceress. The sorceress gave her many different books and taught her various things. She gave her that old magical bag, but its performance is not of the same quality. She can contain many things and everything inside becomes lighter. So it is very useful for her as it helped her survive in this forest. Then she adds, tearfully, that the sorceress recently passed away, leaving her alone in this world. No one looks at her, and the people in the village try to kill her, despite her not doing anything and being unable to do anything. All of this is because she was born without stars. She doesn't know that not having stars is considered so bad to the extent that people want to harm her. She then tells the little jelly that he is like her, born to disappear within a day. This world is unfair, and Avi continues to share a lot with the little jelly as it listens without anger. She is very happy to have met him, considering him her first and last friend, wanting him to stay with her until the end. Avi goes to sleep until morning, waking up and looking in front of her to talk to the jelly, but he's not there. She searches for him, hearing something might have happened to him, and tears stream down her face as she searches, thinking he might be dead. Now she is alone again, just like before, and Avi cries a lot about it. Then she heads towards her bag to take out the map, planning to follow the sorceress's advice to go to the royal capital. When she takes out the map, she feels something inside, and to her joy, it's the little jelly. Avi is overjoyed to see him and realizes that what she read about disappearing in a day was a lie. She takes him under a tree and looks in the book for how to tame monsters. She discovers that to tame any monster, she must transfer a small amount of magical energy to the monster first. If the monster accepts it, a mark appears on its face, indicating successful tame. Avi is afraid to do this because she is a tamer without stars. However, she gathers her strength and teams the little jelly. Avi uses her power to successfully tame him and names him Sora. The jelly is very happy, playing with her, and Avi at this moment tells him her name. After several days, we see Avi in the forest attempting to hunt a small mouse. She succeeds in catching it and proceeds to slaughter it, taking it with her in her bag to cook its meat. Avi then opens her map and examines it, as she is trying to reach a town near the capital of this kingdom, as the sorceress instructed her. The sorceress told her that she should go there and then told Gel about her origin in the village of Latomi. She also pointed out the location of the royal capital, which is not on the map. It is on the other side of her village. So, she first heads to her hometown, Otto, to reach the capital. At this time, strong winds arise that would have blown away the gel, but Avi manages to hold on to it at the last moment. Avi talks to Gel, saying that he needs to grow up so that he doesn't remain so lightweight, as he is a rare Jeel and she doesn't want to lose him. So while speaking with Jao, she senses something approaching and takes Jao and runs away to escape a monster. Avi hides above a tree, discovering a massive swarm of giant ants, a type of ferocious monster. They continue on their way without noticing her. Afterward, Avi descends from the tree and Gel comes out, but she tries to preserve him, unsure when she might encounter fierce monsters. Avi then senses something on her face and finds a small wound caused by a branch. So at this moment, she takes out antidote bottles to treat the wound before it gets infected. Avi uses the antidote, but it runs out, so she decides to buy more and roams the forest, since she knows there is a village nearby if she follows this path. Avi walks along this path and finds posters hanging on trees with her picture and specifications. Anyone who finds her would receive a reward of 500 gold coins. Avi becomes very upset, not understanding why they are offering such a large sum for her when she hasn't done anything. In anger, she removes those posters from the trees and cuts them. After some time, Avi reaches the village. Before entering, she puts the gel in her bag so no one sees it. Avi enters the village in disguise, discovering that they use magic in all their activity. She wishes she could use magic as well. Avi finds children playing together. The boy has the skill of speed, and his sister lacks any skill. Afi wandered around the village and came across a bakery. She got very excited because it had been a long time since she had eaten any kind of bread. However, she didn't care much because she didn't have any money. She continued on her way and found a butcher. She thought about selling the meat she had caught and lingered around the butcher. So the butcher noticed her and asked what she wanted. She told him that she had things to sell, and the butcher agreed. 
Afi took out the meat she had and was surprised that the butcher could smell that it was field mouse meat without seeing it. He explained that he had a heightened sense of smell and could distinguish scents. Afi handed him the meat, and when he opened it, he found it to be very fresh and well-prepared. He asked about the quantity, and Afi showed him a large amount of field mouse meat. The butcher calculated the price, and it reached 100 pieces. Afi was thrilled because she would finally have a lot of money to spend as she pleased. The butcher asked her to bring more meat if she hunted again, since everyone sought large prey, and field mice were rarely brought to him. She left and went to the bakery to buy bread. There, she encountered a merchant who treated her as if she were a boy and asked about her identity. Afi explained that she had relatives in the village and inquired about the quantity she could buy with 100 pieces. The merchant told her she could take everything in that basket. So Afi bought a large amount of bread and happily ran off. She returned to the forest with her friend, the jelly, and sat on a tree to enjoy the delicious bread, savoring the moment as it had been a long time since she last had such a treat. She asked the jelly for its opinion on the bread, but it didn't respond. Afi understood that it didn't want the bread and proceeded to take out the items it usually consumed. We're dissipating jelly creatures. The jelly tried to explain, but Afi couldn't understand. She took the jelly and roamed the forest, hunting more field mice. Later, she decided to return to the butcher to sell the meat and earn money for more bread. On her way back, she found herself at a landfill and discovered large doses of poison. Unsure if they were still usable, she took them with her, in her bag, feeling ex- Meanwhile, the jelly tried to dispose of some jelly bottles, surprising Afi with its ability to do so. She offered him a bottle, but the jelly refused, making her realize it could only dispose of the blue doses. Afi left the jelly with a bottle and went back to the village to sell more meat. She sold a significant amount of field mouse meat to the butcher, receiving 250 pieces in return. With the money, she bought bread and sweets from the merchant, expressing her gratitude. Afi returned to her spot, went to the lake for a swim, and asked the jelly if it wanted to join, but it declined, fearing it might drift away. Afi comforted the jelly, then took out the poison bottles for it to consume. She also got a piece of bread for herself and happily ate, appreciating the kindness of the villagers and hoping she could stay there forever. The next day, Avi wanders around the village and encounters many adventurers. One of them approaches her and starts talking to her about what they want. As Avi looks at him, she realizes that he is the person she's been searching for. However, he doesn't recognize her because she is disguised as a boy. Another adventurer asks her about the magical bag she carries, making Avi very afraid. She runs away from them, thankful that they didn't recognize her as Femisha, and continues running until the butcher stops her. The butcher asks Avi if she caught any field mice. Avi informs him that she didn't catch anything that day. The butcher tells her that some adventurers have passed through the village, bought all his dried meat, claiming they need it for their journey. He ran out of stock and asks Avi to bring him more mice. Avi agrees, and the butcher mentions that he'll raise the buying price for her. Avi thanks him and hurries to the bakery. It's not the bakery. The baker asks Avi if she wants bread for the day. Avi declines, but the baker insists on giving her a piece of her favorite loaf for free. She asks Avi to wait and eat it fresh without paying, as she'll have to eat it eventually. Avi hesitates as she doesn't have money, but the baker insists she can pay later. Avi thanks her, but upon seeing her reflection in the baker's eyes, hastily leaves to avoid being recognized. At sunset, Avi sits on her usual tree, crying and talking about the kind people in the village. She realizes she cannot stay there for long due to the presence of adventurers. She then extracts the gal and asks if there's a place for her. She wants reassurance. The girl sleeps sadly, and by morning she decides to leave the village. As Avi walks, she consults her map, unsure if she's on the right path. The gel attempts to communicate, but Avi doesn't understand. However, she senses it's hungry. She reaches a river with fruit trees, asks the gel to try the fruit, but it refutes. Avi insists that if it doesn't learn to eat everything, it won't grow. Suddenly the tree changes color and a large monster emerges, attacking Avi. She runs away, injured, searching for antidotes, but can't find any. The gel stands on her wound and Avi doesn't know what it's doing. Our story begins when Vimisha was reminiscing about her past or when someone was narrating her past while her father sat outside the house trimming a piece of wood. Suddenly, his wife was blessed with a newborn, bringing immense joy to the father. He quickly rushes inside, opens the door, and is informed by the midwife that the mother and the newborn are both healthy and free of any complications. The father rejoices greatly, thanking the midwife for her assistance. They decide to name the baby Vimisha, a name that brings much joy to the mother. Over the years, the scene transitions to Vimisha growing up. We see her running around the house, calling her brother, who has a meal prepared by her. The family, including the father, sits together to eat, and even their dog joins them. 
Bimisha, in her haste, drinks her water quickly, leading her brother to advise her to chew her food more carefully. The father then emphasizes the importance of Vimisha eating plenty to grow quickly and be strong, warning her against being frail as people may take advantage and bully her. Later, Vimisha returns home, where her mother welcomes her. Her brother advises her to use magic quickly, but the mother intervenes, assuring her that there's no need to rush. She encourages Vimisha that everyone evolves at their own pace and acknowledges her impressive skills in helping others. Vimisha expresses that this was not the advice given to her when she was four as she had always wished to hurry and unlock her supernatural abilities. Vimisha then prepares a meal for the family, placing their favorite dish called Yakni Nunoshi on the table. The father, delighted, credits Vimisela, who possesses the soothing skill for contributing to the preparation and promises that it will alleviate his fatigue quickly. The family enjoys the meal together, portraying a wonderful picture of collaboration, joy, and shared smiles. Later in the evening, everyone was busy with their individual tasks, yet all gathered in one place as the father updated them about the house. He mentioned that some final touches needed to be completed by the end of the month, referring to their new home. We then see Vimisha handling furniture and beautiful wooden pieces, while her mother, skilled in sewing, works on a bridal dress for her brother, who is a shoemaker. The mother tears up, and Vimisha asks her what's wrong. The mother reveals that she remembered Vimisha and her younger sister will eventually leave for another house when they get married. Time is passing swiftly, and soon the day will come. The father comments on how fast time flies, as Vimisha turns five. He advises her that children at this age start shouldering responsibilities, and her unique skill will always find a place for her to work and earn her next meal. The mother adds that skills and talents are God-given, but it's crucial to nurture them through daily practice and continuous learning. Vimisha's brother with yellow hair chimes in, confirming the importance of skills. He mentions that with three stars, like his own skill, you're safe, but with just one star, like Vimisela's soothing skill, you might face elimination. When Vimisha asks them to stop talking, she huddles with her family. Her brother advises her to choose her skill wisely. Vimisha expresses her desire to be a monster tamer, making friends with dragons, sheep, snakes, and all kinds of creatures. Her family laughs and her sister smiles. The father sits beside her and emphasizes that skills are divine gifts, and they may or may not be granted. He gives her a wooden horse, symbolizing the potential to navigate this world. However, he warns that God can choose to grant or withhold these abilities. As they rejoice in Vimisha's decision, there's a knock on the door. At this late hour, they wonder who could be visiting. The mother stood up to open the door and found it to be Mrs. Labwa. She apologized for coming at such a late hour, but realized it was time to impart skills to Vimisha. The mother welcomed Mrs. Labwa into the house, introducing her to the little girl, Vimisha, praising her intelligence since she started speaking at a young age. However, she expressed concern about Vimisha sometimes saying peculiar things, prompting Mrs. Labois' visit. Mrs. Labois was surprised and questioned the mother about what peculiar things Vimisha said. The mother explained that her husband thought she was making too much of it, but she worried about whether Vimisha could use her supernatural abilities or not, referring to magic. Vimisha's mother then asked Mrs. Labois if magic exists in this world, Mrs. Labois confirmed it, bringing great joy to Vimisha. Mrs. Labois was asked about certain things that Vimisha wasn't fully aware of regarding creation and existence. She assured them not to worry, mentioning that the child would become exceptionally intelligent. And Mrs. Labois, while acknowledging that she doesn't personally believe in such things, decided to bring some happiness to the girl by reading her fortune. Vimisha was instructed to fetch a new candle. Vimisha questioned the concept of fortune reading and Mrs. Labwa clarified that it relies on the unseen known only to God. Despite not fully believing in such practices, Mrs. Labwa intended to bring joy to Vimisha by saying a few words, nothing more or less. As Mrs. Labwa prepared for the fortune reading, she approached Vimisha and asked if she had memories of her past life. Vimisha was surprised by the question, and Mrs. Labwa warned her that revealing such memories, even to her mother, could complicate matters. Vimisha promised not to say anything again. After Mrs. Labwa concluded some chants and statements, she informed them that it was done. The mother eagerly asked if Vimisha saw the skill she would acquire, and Vimisha replied that she had a one-star skill, making it impossible for her to see other skills. In those moments, Vimisha's brother confronted Mrs. Labwa, accusing her of being a fraud, as only charlatans claim to know the unseen. This angered the father, and he reprimanded his son, urging him to be considerate of Vimisha's feelings. The father was particularly upset and bit his son's ear, warning him to stop hurting Vimisha emotionally. The next morning, Vimisha underwent an initiation ceremony to strengthen her abilities. 
The man overseeing the ritual indulged in some superstitions, thinking they were true. However, he used his magic and informed them that Vamisha possessed the skill of a beast tamer and the ability to earn monsters. Despite Vamisha having no stars, the father doubted the accuracy of the man's magic, insisting that his daughter couldn't be without stars. The scene shifted to a bar where the angry father resorted to heavy drinking, displaying erratic behavior. He vented his frustration, hitting the table with his hand and expressing disbelief at the idea of Vimisha lacking stars. The mother tried to calm him down, advising him not to exaggerate. Later, in a fit of rage, the father destroyed a wooden horse with his foot, questioning Vimisha's true identity. The mother, accused of dishonesty, broke down in tears. Vimisha approached her to console her, but her brother intervened, shouting at her not to touch their mother. He forcibly dragged Vimisha outside and commanded her to leave the house immediately. Heartbroken, Vimisha ran out of the house, while the family discussed the implications of a child without stars, considering it a disastrous omen. The man who performed the ritual warned them of impending disasters, and Vimisha overheard the conversation from a distance. As she fled, some children threw stones at her, taunting her as someone without stars, and she ran into the distant forest, crying and questioning why this had happened. The situation worsened with rain pouring down, and Vimisha found herself hungry and alone. Unable to return to the house, she gazed at it from afar. The circumstances took a turn for the worse as Vimisha faced hunger and isolation with no refuge in sight. Then Vimisha finds some fruits and eats them. Afterwards, she seeks refuge in a small cave from the intense rain, but the cold is too harsh. She breaks some sticks and twigs, then lights a fire to warm herself. She uses her strength twice until she loses consciousness. When she wakes up, she finds an old lady and Mrs. Labwa beside her. Suddenly, Mrs. Labwa appears and assures Vimisha about her well-being. Mrs. Labwa explains that Vimisha seems to have less magical energy than most people and warns her that depleting her magical energy could endanger her life. Mrs. Labwa offers Vimisha a warm drink which she eagerly consumes, feeling much better. Mrs. Roba, another lady, suddenly appears and checks on Vimisha. Mrs. Roba mentions that Vimisha has limited magical energy and provides her with a magical bag and a book. The bag appears old but can hold many things, and anything placed inside becomes old. The book contains valuable knowledge that will be useful to Vimisha. Vimisha is astonished when Mrs. Labwa talks about a journey, but Mrs. Roba explains that Vimisha should explore neighboring towns and expand her horizons. Mrs. Labwa advises Vimisha not to force herself to continue traveling if she finds a place she wants to stay permanently. However, she should look for trustworthy people and be open with them about everything. Vimisha wonders why Mrs. Labwa is so kind to her despite being without stars. Mrs. Labwa laughs and says that she doesn't hate her, reassuring Vimisha that everything hidden eventually comes to light. Vimisha asks if Mrs. Labwa hates her, and Mrs. Labwa responds, Why would I hate you? Everyone hates me as if I were without stars. Mrs. Labwa informs Vimisha that in ancient times, nobody possessed skills or stars. People lived happily without skills, and not having a skill was not a bad thing. Vimisha becomes sad and questions why things have changed now. Mrs. Labwa admits she doesn't know and wonders about the reason herself. The scene shifts three years later and Vimisha is scavenging through debris, looking for anything useful. She starts collecting pieces of wood to kindle fires when needed. Suddenly, she discovers a blue potion, and after taking it, she becomes very happy. She has a fruitful day, collecting a substantial load. As Vimisha sits by the river enjoying her meal, she wonders why Mrs. Labwa hasn't visited recently. Concerned, she goes to the village and finds a large gathering in front of the church. Inside, she hears people talking about losing someone dear to them due to the cold. Vimisha realizes it's Mrs. Labwa and is shocked by the news. Later, Vimisha overhears her father telling the village elder that she wasn't in the shelter and must have sensed their presence and fled. The village elder insists that they must act against this. An individual without stars shouldn't be allowed to stay in their world. Vimisha is horrified, imagining the earth splitting open, and envisions her family regretting her existence, wishing she was never born. On the other side, the village chief gathers all the residents and informs them that Mrs. Labwa was crucial for their village. He attributes her death to a curse, stating that Mrs. Luna warned her about Vimisha, the starless and ostracized girl. The curse Mrs. Labwa received was due to ignoring the warning about Vimisha, who is now condemned and shunned by everyone. The village chief declares Vimisha a disaster and a threat to the village. He urges the villagers to find her, stating that she must be captured, and they will kill her before she brings catastrophe to their village. The people start searching the forest with torches, looking for Vimisha. She tries to escape, but the villagers corner her. She questions why she is being treated this way, emphasizing that she hasn't committed any wrongdoing. Vimisha imagines her father preparing to strike her with a large hammer, intending to kill her. 
Suddenly, Ramisha wakes up, realizing it was all a nightmare. She is terrified, her heart pounding with fear. Looking at the sky, she notices a wall sticking to her hand, fearing it might consume her. Designed to her fate, she contemplates her unwanted existence as a child. In the morning, Sora attempts to wake her, and she realizes her wound has completely healed. Sora, who now can speak, utters boo-boo, making Vimisha ecstatic that he can come. She thanks Sora for healing her and expresses gratitude for him, despite being an unwanted child. Vimisha decides to live a bit longer, as she feels content when she's with Sora. The episode concludes with a message asking viewers to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell for upcoming exciting episodes. <laughs> In an exhilarating episode, Vimisha finds herself colliding with some monsters who have ruthlessly slain everyone on the carriage. Can Vimisha escape and confront this grave danger? Stay tuned until the end to uncover all the secrets in a thrilling manner. Our episode begins with Vimisia and Sora, both asleep when suddenly a drop of water falls on Sora's head, waking him up. He realizes that it's morning and tries to wake up Vimisia, who indeed wakes up and notices that Sora seems unusually energetic this morning. They both start having breakfast, with Sora consuming glass bottles and Vimisia eating a berry. Suddenly, Vimisia observes that Sora has grown slightly taller and can now jump higher. She is amazed that he has learned all these new abilities. She grabs him, lifts him up, and notices that his texture has become more solid. They believe he has become an adult because he consumed a lot of those blue doses. Suddenly, Sora jumps out of her hand, takes another blue dose, and joyfully continues to explore his newfound abilities. Emisia is delighted with Sora's improved health and expresses her happiness, attributing it to the many fruits she gathered. However, the dried meat is running out and they decide to buy more in the next village. Suddenly, Vimizia notices that Sora has consumed all the blue doses he had and seems to want more. Concerned, she takes him and walks into the forest until they reach a garbage dump. There she searches for food for Sora and discovers some glass bottles with doses. However, she also finds beautiful clothes, which angers Sora. She tells him they need to find his food first. Vimesia finds many bottles with various doses, and Sora eagerly starts consuming them one after another. She then gives him a green dose, but he struggles to eat it. Trying another purple dose, it turns out it breaks the curses, and he refuses to eat it as well. Suddenly, an idea crosses Vimesia's mind. She decides to mix the colors together, combining blue and red to create a purple dose. When she gives it to Sora, he happily consumes it until he is completely satisfied. Just afterward, they leave the place, and the weather is beautiful. They are extremely optimistic as they believe they will be able to travel to a distant place. Vimesia never imagined that traveling could be so enjoyable, and she is very happy to have met Sora. She had always thought she would travel alone and live her life in solitude, making her extremely grateful for the unexpected companionship. Suddenly, she sees a lot of these delicious berries called Nibiri and decides to buy many of them. She starts picking them, attempting to offer some to Sora, but he refuses to eat them at all. She tells him about their delicious taste, but he remains uninterested. And deterred, she continues picking a lot of Nibiri and puts them in her magical bag that can hold anything. Later at sunset, they sit down for a meal, and she happily indulges in the Nibiri, wishing the entire journey could be filled with these tasty fruits and hoping for abundant grapes as well. She notices that Sora has finished his meal, and she offers him more Nibiri. Surprisingly, he starts eating them all, leaving her astonished as she worries about him overeating and leaving nothing for later. But suddenly, Sora grabs the handful of berries from her hand and eats them all, still very hungry. She becomes sad, realizing that at this rate, he will consume all of them, leaving nothing for their journey. As long as Sora is awake, he will keep eating, so she must make him sleep as soon as possible to ensure they have enough for the entire journey. Just then, she carries him on her hands and says to him, I will tell you a bedtime story. They sit on a tree at night, and she begins to tell him a story she heard a lot when she was little. The story dates back to a time when the world was in a state of war. One day, the king gathered the sorcerers who could foresee the future and asked them to predict how the war would end. The vision they saw was the end of the world, a terrifying scene. Most of the sorcerers discussed their vision, and to protect the world, they unleashed a very powerful magic. No one knew what that magic was, and no one could use it now. The only one capable of using it was a child from another world. It was a forgotten magic, with unknown effects, vast, frightening, and serene. Suddenly, Vimesha falls asleep while narrating this fantastical story, and Sora also falls asleep. After a while, a drop of water falls on Sora, waking him up instantly, realizing it's morning. He wakes up Vimesha, who is surprised to find out that she slept while telling the bedtime story. She is shocked to see that Sora has eaten all the doses. No blue or red doses are left. Then, she climbs down from the tree and catches the mouse to sell and earn money. 
Suddenly, she discovers a large snake in the trap she set for mice. She tries to catch it, thinking she can sell it at a high price, but the snake tries to attack her. Then she took a piece of cloth and covered the snake, which was wriggling in it. She proceeded to pull out a large rope and tied the snake so that it couldn't escape. After that, Vimisha continued on her way, carrying the snake on her back and a wall beside her. She turned right and left, sensing a strange smell, wondering if it was a monster, but she felt nothing. They continued down the road, and to their surprise, they saw a horse covered in blood, an overturned carriage, and everyone inside either injured or dead. As in those moments, Vimisha quickly hid Sara to avoid being targeted by the highwayman, as the situation was very dangerous. She then descended from the hill and found three people drenched in blood. Vimisha was shocked and held her breath, then ran quickly to escape from that place. Her speed was incredible, fueled by the adrenaline released due to her intense fear. She covered some kilometers, but in her normal state, she couldn't cover much distance. Finally, she stopped and caught her breath, looking at a large castle in the distance, seemingly abandoned. Fighting to reach the city, she entered through the main gate, strolling through its streets and contemplating what she had witnessed hours ago. Demisha wanted to inform someone about the incident. At that moment, she entered a building and greeted the people there. The secretary asked her about the thing she was carrying on her shoulder, and Vimisha explained that she had intended to trap a rat but caught a snake instead. The one-eyed man then told her that if she wanted to sell a snake, she should go to a pharmacy, not the town hall. Vimisha thanked them for the information, then informed them that on her way here she discovered some brutally murdered individuals. The method of killing was extremely gruesome. This revelation shocked everyone. It's all that the secretary urged her to come closer and provide more details. Vimisha approached and explained that it happened on the road from the village of Latiotu. A carriage was burning, and people were attacked by some monsters. No one survived the assault. The strong man was astonished and exclaimed, Monsters, did you say monsters? He approached Vimisha with intense scrutiny and questioned her, expressing disbelief. She confirmed the presence of monsters, pointing out the brutal wounds on the bodies and the fact that the horses were dead, not stolen, indicating it wasn't the work of highwaymen. The man acknowledged her intelligence, stating that, if her account was accurate, the village might be under attack. He called out to everyone, emphasizing the seriousness of the situation. He instructed them to search for the exact location and identify the type of monsters. He mentioned that he would file an official request through the guild later. The group quickly mobilized, heading outside to investigate. But a strong man thanked Vimisha for bringing the matter to their attention and assured her that she would receive a reward once they verified the situation. Vimisha was taken aback by this, expressing her surprise at the unexpected turn of events. But the secretary informs her that she can receive money for information about monsters or people who died as a result of monster attacks. If she reports such information to the town hall, she'll be rewarded. Misha wasn't aware of this, but she expresses her happiness at the prospect of earning some money. The secretary hands her the document to keep, and she can return later after they verify the situation. The scene then shifts to the pharmacy, where Vimisha is selling the snake she caught. The pharmacist informs her that the market value for a snake monster is $2 each. However, upon inspection, he finds out that the snake is a rare female, so he offers her $3 for it. He hands her the money, or the equivalent in their currency, and tells her that if she catches more, she can bring them to the pharmacy for purchase. Mamisha leaves the place, delighted to have some currency. She opens her bag for Sora, telling her that she'll search for food for both of them. As she continues her journey, she comes across a red bag, seemingly magical. Upon closer inspection, she discovers numerous bags in the area, around 21 in total. But she desires to take them all, but realizing she can't carry them, she understands that they are old models with varying abilities, not of high precision. She and for Vimisha, her modern backpack held many items. She pondered the situation and came up with an idea. What if she placed those magical bags inside other magical bags? Would that serve her purpose? She decided to give it a try. Master had in, however, when she attempted to put one magical bag inside another, it didn't work. The magical bag couldn't enter the other magical bag, and even an empty magical bag couldn't go into the first one. Vimisha began to think through the situation and divided the bags into four groups. On her left were magical bags that couldn't hold any other magical bags. She pointed to the next group which could hold one magical bag each. The third group could carry two magical bags, and the last one, on her far left, could hold three magical bags. Vimisha contemplated how she would carry all these bags together while still remaining light for easy transport. In engaging in a mathematical process, she finally managed to make the items lighter. However, she needed to find a bag that could carry three magical bags and another that could carry just one. After numerous attempts and calculations, Bimisha eventually solved the problem, but it took a considerable amount of effort. 
Osprey is very happy because she managed to collect the bags together. Then she apologizes and says, Come on, let's go and collect the doses. The slime is very excited about it. After that, we see her walking down the road. Smiles. However, she is surprised to see a group of people, so she tries to hide from them because they are a group of adventurers. Suddenly, one of the adventurers she spoke to before talks to her and tells her that the information she provided us some time ago actually saved them. They were able to verify it immediately because the culprit was the monsters, Gillen and the King of Galan. They managed to do that because they saw traces of Galan around the damaged carriage. When the adventurers followed the traces, they found the King of Galilan, and some powerful adventurers are about to set off to hunt them. <laughs> he warns her that it is dangerous and advises her not to leave the village unless the adventurers can defeat the monsters. He also tells her that he will receive a financial reward for cooperating with them. After that, Ivy goes to collect her rewards and the girl tells her that she deserves to be proud of what she did. She treats her as if she were a boy, not a girl, and asks her if she has the previous document. After that, she starts searching for it in all the bags she's carrying. Eventually, she finds it and gives it to the employee. The employee gives her rewards, which are a silver plate. It's worth five gidadl. Ivy is astonished by this and mentions that the snake monster was worth three gidadl, equivalent to 30 fara. Then this time, it's five gidadl, which is 50 fara. She gets very excited and the employee continues, stating that for information about reporting a high-level monster, as the reward is two gold pieces, which she happily realizes is equivalent to 10 Geidel or 200 Fara. In total, she earned the value of capturing 280 Fara field mice that day, as the employee warns her about the large sum and advises her to be careful not to lose it. Ivy takes the money and goes, but before leaving, the employee tells her to take all the bags she had thrown on the ground. Later, we see Ivy walking in the street, expressing that it's the first time she has obtained such a large amount of money. She wonders if everyone is targeting these gold pieces. It's in the evening, a group of adventurers prepares to hunt monsters, and we see Ivy sitting near them, eating and feeding her slime companion, Sora. And she tells Sora that the forest is very dangerous due to monster hunting, so they'll sleep here tonight. She looks at the map and decides they may have to stay in this town until the monster hunting is over. The next destination is the village of Latomia, and she expresses excitement about it, saying the journey is full of adventures. Finally, she lies down on her back and says she enjoys being with Sora a lot before falling asleep. And this concludes the episode, but don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive updates on new content. Today's episode starts with Vimmesha and her friend Sora, both clearly saddened by the failure of the trap once again. Vimmesha wonders if someone stepped on it, realizing they won't be able to earn any money at this rate. However, she remembers the monetary reward she received from Latham Village. She opens her bag and says, We should be fine for a while, but if this journey continues, I want to save for the future. Suddenly, Sora distances himself and runs off. Vimesha follows him, and he enters the trees. As Vimsha follows, she sees a wounded wolf and feels a weak magical energy towards it. She consults her book to identify the creature, realizing it's an extremely fierce and rare beast. Tree tours the wolf looks at her, frightening Vimesia because it's still alive. She realizes it's very tired and will die soon. She places her hands on its head, reassuring it that she'll stay by its side. <laughs> Suddenly, Sora leaps up, grows in size, and lands on the wolf, beginning to tend its wounds. After finishing, he returns to his normal size, and Vimesia holds him. Suddenly, the wolf stands before her and approaches, playing with her. Vimesha expresses that according to the book, such a monster requires a team of at least five highly ranked adventurers to defeat it, and facing it alone in the forest would be fatal. As the wolf looks at her, Vimesha grows very fond of it, placing her hands on it and playing with it. The scene shifts to Vimesha, Sora, and the wolf on their way to Latom village. Vimesha talks to herself, wondering if she's gained a new friend now, wishing she had greater magical energy to tame him. She tells the wolf he needs a name, and after thinking a little, she names him Sheel, meaning Sky. She introduces herself and introduces him to Sora the Slime. On their way, Vimshia feels people nearby, telling Sora to hide in her magical bag. She looks at Sheal and tells him he can't fit in the bag, and it wouldn't be good for people to see him. Suddenly, Shile hides among the trees. The scene shifts to Vimshia standing in front of the palace, looking at the guard and saying he looks scary. Suddenly, a man approaches from behind, asking her what she's doing. She tells him she's not doing anything, and he leaves. <laughs> As we see Sora trembling with fear in those moments, the man with a backpack approaches. The guard asks him who he is and what he intends to do in Ladam village, which flusters the man. He tells the guard that he's here to visit a friend for the first time. The guard asks for his friend's name, causing more confusion for the man who stammers, Zizilyat. The guard, noticing the man's discomfort, becomes angrier and grabs him, pressing him against the wall. He draws his sword and cuts open the man's bag revealing some items falling out. 
turns and then he checks the other bag, finding bottles of banned alcohol. It turns out the man is trafficking drugs. The guard calls for his friend, Felivera, to take him to prison. Felivera approaches and tells the guard that the man might indeed be a criminal, but he should treat him with more courtesy and kindness as this is not how humans are treated. The man agrees to deal with it later. The guard then takes the man to prison. Vinmeshia is astonished and asks Sora if he could have known about this beforehand, considering his sixth sense. The guard looks at her, appearing very frightening, and fear fills Vimshaya's heart as she hesitates whether to proceed or return. She speaks to herself, realizing that escaping here wouldn't help. It would only raise suspicions. In that case, she decides to continue crossing. As she moves forward, the guard stops her, asking who she is. He speaks to her as if she were a boy, asking her where he's seen her before. She tells him she's not a boy. The guard looks at her strangely, his appearance very terrifying, causing Vimshia to tremble with fear. He asks her what's wrong. She tells him there's a bug on his shoulder. When he sees it, he becomes flustered and afraid. He thanks her for telling him about it. Then he stops her again, asking which family she belongs to. She tells him she's from Latham Village. The guard is surprised, asking if she traveled all that distance alone. He's heard that chaos reigns in Latham Village these days and imagines she must have suffered a lot. He kneels down and assures her that she's now in Latham Village and will be safe. God then he tells her that if she becomes an adventurer, she'll earn a lot of money, so she should work hard. He bids her farewell and lets her go. Finally, Vimisha crosses from the gate into the beautiful city. She quickly runs to a vendor to buy some meat because she wants wild rabbit meat. The vendor tells her it's expensive because it's hard to catch. Vimshia offers to buy it if she manages to catch her prey. The vendor agrees as long as it's fresh but warns her to be cautious of the dangerous Nunosh that frequent the forest. She buys some meat and leaves the place, talking to herself about the creature Nunoshe and the need to set traps for it since it's present in the city. While they're in the village, they shouldn't sleep in the forest, so perhaps they should rest in the adventurer's field. Time she wanders a bit until she finds the adventurer's field, marveling at its beauty and size, realizing that large villages also have open spaces. She tries to enter but encounters the massive guard, frightening her. The guard asks if she wants to stay here, to which she responds affirmatively, explaining she's alone. He advises her to go to the other side as it would be safer for her. He gives her something, explaining it's her permit. Ivmesha doesn't understand, so he clarifies that she won't be allowed in without showing it. She asks about the cost, and he tells her there's no need to pay. They only regulate to prevent potential trouble. Vimesha thanks him and enters the field, feeling extremely tense because of the guard. She spreads her carpet and lies down, feeling very happy. <laughs> she looks around and sees many large tents, wondering if there are mid-ranked adventurers around and hoping to find a place far from them. She looks again and sees small tents on the other side, realizing they belong to beginner adventurers. At this point, she wishes she had a tent like theirs so she wouldn't worry about being noticed. As the weather changes, she wishes she could hide in a tent so she could take out her slime friend Sora. At remembering the monetary reward she received previously, she decides to go to the market to buy a new tent. Indeed, she goes down to the market to buy one and reads on a sign that the shop sells used tents at high prices but offers quick evaluations. Vimesha considers buying a used tent. At this moment, Vimeshia is startled by the presence of an adventurer named Ogdko in front of her. The adventurer apologizes to her and asks if she's going to buy anything. She responds that she's going to buy a tent which visibly affects Aguto since she doesn't even have a tent. Actual understands she's from Latam Village, known for its many problems, and asks if she was expelled from there. Aimsha doesn't answer, so Ogutu asks for her name, speaking to her as if she were a boy. She tells him her name is Avi. Aguto welcomes Avi and introduces himself and his friend Felivera. Then he tells her he'll take her to a big shop run by a skilled old man. Without hesitation, he takes her with him. Felivera asks Aguto to stop because he's hurting her a lot. He apologizes again for what happened and talks to her to reassure her. Vimesha is afraid of him, so Felivera speaks to her, telling her not to be afraid of Ogutu. He's not a bad person, but when an idea enters his mind, he becomes blind to everything around him. Vimesha tells them not to worry about her. Ogutu apologizes again and tells her he'll get her the greatest tent ever. Vimesha is overjoyed because she can't believe her dream is about to come true. They go to the shop Ogutu mentioned and meet the old man. The old man asks what they want, but Oguto says there's nothing here for him to buy. Instead, he mentions a young customer from Latam Village who wants to buy a tent. The old man understands that the child must have been through very difficult times because of what's happening in the village. Then the old man looks at Vimsha and asks her what she wants from him. Vimsha tries to speak to him, but Oguto interrupts quickly, 
asking the old man to give her something cheap and excellent at the same time. The old man gets annoyed because it's clear that this child is very, very annoying. Oguto asks him not to be harsh with his words to children and to be more. The old man tells him that if he's speaking to the child, he should be gentle. The lighter, the better, but then she'll break more easily. Then he asks Vimshia if she prefers a durable tent that will last a long time, or she prefers to buy a new one as required. As these jobs she wants will change her life. So Oguto said to Vimshia, if you have a request, don't hesitate to make it. Vimshia responded, saying, All that matters is that I don't know much about their jobs, but the most important thing is how much it costs in general. The old man answered that the price varies depending on the product. What is your budget? Ogito asked her how she got this amount of money. She replied that she got it in Latum Village, finding victims of a monster attack and was given it as a financial reward. The old man remarked that since she received such a large amount, it must have been an extremely dangerous monster. He was glad she didn't fall victim to it. Then the old man told her that with five geitels, she could buy a good tent. He showed her this tent, saying it was lightweight and durable. It was bought by a person who found a woman immediately after, then retired as an adventurer. The boy asked, do you mean Lazy Joya? The old man said, no need for that talk. Lazy Joya sold me this to be a used tent with new quality. I made some improvements on it, so I guarantee its quality. You won't find a better deal than that. So Vimesia thanked him and gave him the money. He took it from her, saying, I'll put a mark here. Vimesha was surprised, asking, What is this mark? The old man replied, saying, Put a mark in a place only you know, so you know this tent is yours. It could be your name or a symbol, anything that serves the purpose, she said. I found it. I'll use aura. The old man said, Take this item, Shasinto's simple but genuine magical pouch. Here we put money in it and others can't see what's inside. So it will give you extra protection. Vimesha grinned and left. Then Aguta spoke to her on the way, saying, What do you think? She said, I managed to buy some wonderful things and thanked him, he said. We should return to our patrol. After that, the scene shifts to Vimesha as she sets up the tent and talks to the slime, saying, this is our tent. Yep. The slime is very happy. Blindly, it says, I will finally be able to sleep without worry about rain or wind. She tells him, I bought it with money I earned myself, and many people treated me kindly. I feel like I got it for free, but still, this is our home. Am I allowed to have all this? Let's go to the landfill site before nightfall and collect doses. This is a big village, so they must be throwing away a lot, she said. Then she leaves the tent and is surprised to find these people in front of her, and this man accuses her of being a thief. When these thieves appear, they accuse Vimesha of being a thief. One of them claims that this tent belongs to him. They do this as a play to take this great tent. Then this thief claims that this boy means Vimesha because he looks like a boy when he cut his hair in the past. To sell saddles, everyone who sees him thinks he is a boy, not a girl. She tells them, I didn't steal it, but bought this tent myself. The big man grabs her clothes and starts searching her bag, suddenly noticing Sora in the bag. They are amazed by this creature, as they have never seen anything like it before. The big man threatens Vimesha and threatens to kill her. And suddenly, this guard comes and tells them that anyone causing trouble will be fined and expelled. So the big man says, this boy stole my friend's tent, and we are the victims here. Then the guard asks them, do you have evidence that this tent is yours? The big man says, it's impossible for a naughty, dirty child like this to buy such a tent. Then the guard holds the big man's hand and releases the girl, saying, this tent belongs to this boy. The person claiming to be the owner of the tent begins to say, this is my tent. The guard asks him, where did you buy this tent? The claimant replies, there's no need for you to know that. Then the guard tells them that this is a used tent bought from the old man Lago, the landlord. The man is annoyed and says, speak as you like, but what do you know about it? Then the guard tells them that the ones who recognized this boy at the shop were the leader Aguto and his deputy Filiver from the Latomi village guard. And everyone is shocked and stunned by this statement. Then the guard asks the claimant again. The big man says, we just misunderstood, that's all, and there's no problem. But the guard gets angry and tells them that he has many questions, unfortunately, and wants to ask them, but if they try to escape, he won't spare them. Then they all try to escape. So the guard whistles for his comrades to come to him quickly and the remaining guards surround them, immobilizing them. Then the guard attacks the thief who claimed the tent belonged to him, knocking him to the ground, and the rest of the guards apprehend the other thieves. However, the big man and the girl try to escape, but some guards pursue them. Afterward, the leader of the guards orders the guards to take the thieves to jail, then he goes to check on the boy. He thanks him profusely for his assistance and apologizes to him for the terrifying experience he had on his first day in the village. Vimshia then thanks him for saving her and asks him how he knew that was her tent. 
He tells her that the guard Aguto passed by some time ago during his patrol and said that a boy would set up a tent alone and ask me to look after you. Despite all that, I, as a guard here, am very ashamed of what happened to you. Then the guard gives him the blue dose to forgive him, making Vimesha very happy because it is a completely new and original dose. The guard tells him to consider it an apology from me to you, so Vimesha thanks him profusely. The guard informs him that he must go now and investigate these thieves and if anything happens, he should summon him immediately. In the evening, the girl celebrates with her friend for getting a new tent. And with Mr. Episode ends today, stay tuned for upcoming episodes, but we kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. In an exhilarating episode, Vimikia will encounter the highwaymen who want to take the slime from her. What will she do? And the leader of the hearth reveals the truth to Vimikia that he is not bold. Imagine his reaction when he learns this revelation. Many thrilling events unfold, leading to the climax where you'll discover everything. Our episode begins on that sunny day as Vimikia emerges from her tent, enjoying the beautiful weather. She asks Sora if they're going hunting today, to which Sora eagerly responds, igniting Vimikia's excitement. On their way to hunt, a guard asks Vimikia why she woke up early, and she tells him she's going hunting. We then see Vimikia walking through the town, meeting many people who all know her and chat with her. Vimikia wonders how everyone knows her. The scene then shifts to Vimikia and Sora, where Vimikia tells Sora that Nunoshi has destroyed the trap again, meaning they won't be able to catch anything in this condition. Vimikia wants to hunt as much as possible during the summer to save some money. She feels an unusual sensation, and when she looks back, she sees the wolf, Shail, who has caught many rabbits and gives them to her. Vimikia is overjoyed, hugs Shiel, and after counting, finds nine rabbits. She decides to prepare and cook them to sell them fresh. After some time, Vimikia finishes preparing the meat and goes to wake up Sora and Shiel to sell the meat. The wolf wakes up and starts playing with Vimikia. She thanks him for allowing her to have all that meat for the day. Then he leaves, and Vimikia, Sora, and Shiel head out too. They go to the store and the owner tells them that the meat is very fresh with a delicious smell and that they caught the rabbits without harming vital organs. Vimikia tells Sora they used traps, surprising the store owner because usually prey suffer in traps, affecting the taste negatively, but there's no sign of that in the meat. She also mentions her skill in cutting the meat evenly, pricing each at 95 dinars, making the total for nine rabbits 855 dinars. The store owner thanks Vimikia and tells her she's welcome any time. Vimikia walks away happily, attributing all her success to Shiel. She meets several guards who ask her about hunting and money. Then we see Vimikia hiding and wondering once again how these guards know who she is. Suddenly, Mr. Filivera appears before her and asks why she's hiding in such a place. He then walks into the town and tells her that Commander Oguto informed them that if a young adventurer named Evie ever gets into trouble, they should make sure to help him. He had been saying this to all the guards, emphasizing that although he's a young boy, he works hard, so they should take good care of him. Then Mr. Filivera leaves, and we see Vimikia talking to herself, grateful for Commander Oguto's feelings but not fond of attracting attention. She then goes to the fruit cellar and is very excited to find Zaro fruit, but they are expensive. The seller tells her it took a long time to get Zaro fruit, and she asks if they were picked from the Latomi village. The seller confirms this and explains that it's the only area where Zaro fruit grows, but the harvest was poor this year. Then he asks her if she's from Latomi village, to which she responds affirmatively. He then asks about her parents, and she tells him she travels alone, leading him to assume she's the foolish village chief's mistake. Vimikia doesn't understand his words, and asks him what's happening in Latomi village now. He tells her about a fortune teller named Lady Loba, who used to protect the Zaro fruit crops in Latomi village. Harvesting these fruits was always challenging, so they relied on her predictions. Lady Loba was highly respected by the villagers, but the foolish village chief couldn't tolerate it. When Lady Loba fell ill, he refused to give her any medicine, and she died. The villagers never expected her to die from a cold at that time of the year. Additionally, the merchant heard that the village chief is trying to blame a child because Lady Loba ignored his warnings and took care of a starless one. After losing the fortune teller suddenly, the Zaro harvest in Latomi village failed, leading to a financial crisis. 
The chief attempted to reduce the number of mouths to feed, but some rebelled, taking their families and leaving the village, while others defied the chief and were expelled. Vimikia was asked why she fled, and she explained that her parents support the chief, causing trouble for her. Then, the merchant took out a Zaro fruit and gave it to Vimikia, who refused it, knowing it's too expensive. The merchant explained it overripened and couldn't be sold now, understanding she must be facing difficulties. Vimikia thanked him for his help, then returned to her tent, talking to her jelly friend, lamenting her family's rejection. However, she found joy in her new companions, Jelly, Sheel, Mr. Oguto, and Mr. Filibera, who all love and support her. She realizes she has a place to live, albeit small, and is content. The Jelly tries to convey this message, eventually succeeding, expressing they'll remain friends forever. She then tastes a piece of the fruit, finding it delicious, reminiscent of the fortune teller's taste. She remembers the fortune teller's advice to find a place to live in the nearby town to the royal capital, but to find trustworthy people and share everything about herself with them. The next day, Vimikia wakes up in a calm and beautiful atmosphere. She goes outside where she receives greetings from everyone she meets on the street. Everyone loves her and appreciates her efforts, despite her young age. Vimikia goes about her work, making traps for hunting, and then asks the slime to go collect its meal in the garbage dump. Suddenly, she senses people in the area, so the slime hides in her bag. Indeed, two members of the Highwaymen gang appear recognizing Vimikia as Avi, they threaten to kill her, blaming her for the arrest of their friend. When they realize she has a rare slime, they demand she give it to them in exchange for their forgiveness. However, Vimikia refuses, because the slime is her friend. As Vimikia refuses to hand over the bag, revealing her friend Sora is inside, one of the thieves suggests she taste a bitter liquid as punishment. When she refuses, the thief threatens to beat her. Terrified, Vimikia runs away and the thief chases her. However, she sets traps everywhere, causing the thief to stumble. The female thief laughs at him and chases after Vimikia. The angry thief declares that she won't escape his grasp. As Vimikia runs, the female thief appears in front of her and the male thief behind her. The male thief grabs her and demands the bag and its contents. Suddenly, a wolf appears, frightening them. The wolf attacks the male thief, saving Vimikia. She thanks the wolf for saving her life and says something strange, comparing the situation to catching wild rabbits. Vimikia senses more people approaching, revealed to be Oguto and Filivera. Oguto asks if she's all right, and when he mentions hearing the roar of a beast and human cries while wandering in the forest, then the scene shifts to a room where Ogiti talks to Vimikia, saying, Regarding those four adventurers who were bothering you, they've all been investigated. They were stealing money and small goods, falsely accusing others. Their crimes were reported to the Adventurers Guild, but it was difficult to find evidence against them. However, there's another matter I need to apologize for. The two we apprehended today were wanted for murder. They'll become slaves without manumission, and the other two have been sentenced to long-term servitude. So you won't encounter them again. You can rest assured. Vimikia thanks him, and he informs her that since she contributed to their capture, she'll receive a financial reward. The standard reward for an ordinary person is 5,000 dals for a killer and 2,000 dals for others. However, the guild offers a bounty of one doll for each of them, totaling two dolls and three gidals. Vimikia is overjoyed, stating that the monetary reward she received in Latum equated to 2,800 fars, so she already has more than the 5,000 fars value. He then gives her the money and asks if she has an account for herself. He offers to help her set up an account at the Merchant Guild to ease her worries about carrying such a large sum. The scene then shifts to the Merchant Guild, where the clerk instructs Vimikia to put a drop of her blood here. She pricks her finger on the needle, and a screen appears displaying Aguti's details. He learns Vimikia's true age and is astonished, as he thought she was around six or seven years old. Vimikia enters the room and hands all her money to the clerk, taking the tablet Oguti hands her. Oguti tells her that with this tablet, she can withdraw money from any merchant guild in any village or town. Vimikia is surprised to find a deposit book with her, and thanks Oguti for his help and cooperation. Suddenly, Vimikia's friend, Filivera, arrives, furious because Commander Oguti didn't inform him of his whereabouts, as he had been looking for him for a long time. He asks Oguti to inform him of where he is going before leaving. 
Ogoti, feeling ashamed, admits he forgot to tell him. Then the commander invites Vimikia to taste their special dish, Nunochi skewers, which she doesn't know. At that moment, the commander invites her to eat this meal on his account. And so Vimikia is very happy, and the leader praises her. She wonders how much time has passed since she was praised. Then they go to this lady, thinking that Vimikia is one of the leader Oguto's children. After that, they ask her for ten skewers of Nonuchi for each of them, saying it's very delicious and easy to eat ten of them. Vimikia then presents them with these delicious meals, and she starts eating. She finds the food very delicious and thanks them for it. Filivera remarks that this lady is very skilled, and it's no wonder the royal capital requests her food. Vimikia, feeling sad, reveals that her cooking skill is only at a four-star level. The leader explains that the two people they captured have a three-star running skill, making it very difficult to catch them. Filivera suggests if the guards could use more people with running skills, but the leader explains that everyone has suitable combat skills. Then the leader asks Vimikia about her skill. Filivera suggests that if her skill is suitable, she might join the guards in the future, which they find to be a good idea. Vimikia then reveals that she's actually a tamer, which delights them, and the leader praises her skill as one that can help many people. The leader asks how many stars her taming skill has, and Vimikia becomes very sad. The leader notices this and reassures her, saying they see many people with many stars but without usefulness, like the members of the gang who were literally like that. Filivera agrees stating that even with many stars, many fail to use their skills properly and end up on the wrong path in life. It's their duty to put such people under their control. The leader concludes by saying that there are many deserving people with only one star and many who do excellent work with only one star. So Vimikia, feeling worried, observes them interacting with each other in the evening. She thinks to herself that she doesn't even possess that one star. In the morning, Vimikia leaves through the village gate and finds the leader and his friend standing there. She informs them that she is leaving because she promised the scouts that she would go to the neighboring town near the royal capital. They are very saddened by her departure. The leader jokingly tells her that if anything bad happens to her, she should only mention his name, and if she says she's Oguto's friend, she can go anywhere. Vimikia thanks them deeply for everything they've done for her, bids them farewell, and leaves. The leader tells her to return someday, and they'll be waiting for her. Vimikia assures him that she will someday. Filivera informs the leader that both the Adventurer's Guild and the Merchant's Guild have given Latomi Village the lowest ranking, the same place where that child came from who is classified as number one. They ask about the list of people who left the village. The leader explains that he checked all of them, but the child's name was not listed. Most people left the village as whole families, but there was only one child, an eight-year-old girl, who escaped alone. The leader understands that this girl must have a secret that made her hide her gender. Filivera suggests that this might be the reason she couldn't trust her. The leader agrees, remarking on how the events in Latomi Village affected her feelings. He tells Filivera that one day she will tell them. The leader concludes by saying that he is sure of it, and thus ends our episode today. Stay tuned for more episodes of this wonderful anime, but we kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. In one of the most thrilling episodes, dangers lurked everywhere around Vemisha. She was attacked by the killer giants, but her friend Sheil intervened to fend them off. However, he fell into the river, making the situation even more dire for Vimisha. Eventually, she was captured by these monsters. Will Vimisha survive this attack? Follow the story to its conclusion to find out everything. Our episodes begin with this anime, where we see Sora running with Vimicia chasing after him, asking him to wait for her. Vimicia then sits down to rest for a while, drinks, and tells Sora that he seems very energetic today. Sora appears very happy, but Vimicia realizes that Sora has changed after treating Shield's wounds. He consumed the wounds and evolved. Indeed, he loves the blue doses that heal wounds, but Vimisha doesn't finish her conversation. She notices Sora moving away from her a little, so she follows him and asks him what's wrong. Then she is surprised to see a very large hole and says that the Nuno Show was digging here in search of Yumamo. She wonders how big this Nuno Show is. Suddenly she hears a sound, and when she looks, she sees the wolf shield. She becomes very happy and starts playing with him, telling them that she loves them very much. The scene transitions to the night, and we see Vimisha eating grilled meat and telling the wolf that it was easy to prepare dinner when he caught many wild rabbits. 
She thanks him for that and says that tomorrow she will wake up early to check the field mouse traps. The next morning, Vimisha goes to check the traps but finds no mice at all. She feels sad and says that she came back empty-handed, but she still has some leftover meat from the previous night and will eat it for breakfast. Then suddenly, Vimisha feels a strange sensation and looks to see winds coming towards her. She wonders what this is, and then the slime enters her backpack as she runs away. We see that thing chasing them, making her feel nauseous. Vimisha runs until she reaches the edge of the pit. When she looks at the winds, she realizes that it's not a monster, but human. Suddenly, the wolf shield appears, and then those winds disappear, surprising Vimisha, who wonders what that was. Then we see Vimisha on the wolf's back, thanking him for saving her. She remembers the uncomfortable feeling and wonders what it was. Suddenly, the wolf gets angry and we see Ogre climbing the mountain to reach them. The wolf puts Vimishia on the ground and prepares to attack. When the ogre appears, the wolf attacks him, and they both fall into the lake. Then Vimishia looks up and sees many monsters attacking her. She flees quickly until she reaches a strange place with many trees and many logs are hanging from them like corpses. She wonders what this means, and when the monsters appear again, Vimishia continues to flee. She steps on one of the traps and gets caught in a net on a tree just as the monster approaches her. Just before it attacks her, a magical force appears to attack it, with a person named Latrova using fire attacks to eliminate them. Then he looks up and sees Vimisha, who tells him that the net is very hot. Then Vimisha screams as the fire is too intense for her. Latrova is surprised to see a child up there in the trap, but another person comes and rescues Vimisha by shooting the rope with an arrow, causing her to fall but the boy Latrova catches her just in time. However, the monster approaches them and almost kills them, but then a girl named Mila arrives and uses her gel to save them. She then summons more gals to her aid, and the rest of the group kills the large monsters. They were numerous. While Vimisha watches, astonished, they are powerful and organized, and they work together. Then Vimisha starts to get to know them. They are the suppression squad sent to this area after hearing that monsters were hunting and killing humans, they apologize to her for the trap she fell into, explaining that it was meant for the monsters, not her. She fell into it by mistake. They reassure her that she's okay, and she thanks them for saving her. The boy with golden hair tells her they are a group of adventurers called the Blazing Swords. The one with white hair is the leader named Cecil. The one beside him is called Noja. The one with long hair and a bow is named Shivali. And the boy with blue eyes is Latrova, consulting with the girl behind him named Myla. Vimishia introduces herself with a pseudonym A.V. happy to have met them. Tree seven sinistos with scene shifts and the leader speaks to her as they walk. Their camping site is at the bottom of the hill. But what is she doing here in the midst of the mountains, he asks. She tells them she was on her way to the town of Otolu from a village called Latomi the Tame. Afterwards, the monsters chased me again, so everyone is surprised that she's alone as the monsters are hovering in the area. Therefore, they all go to the same place, but it's necessary for her to travel with them to be safe. Then the leader points out the location of the suppression squad's camping site. Sezok mentions that there are many adventurer groups with them in this location. At this moment, Sheil appears, and when Vimisha sees him, she is very happy but also very worried because if anyone finds her now, they will hunt her down. She keeps gesturing for him to leave, but he doesn't understand her. She continues to signal for him to understand and leave, until Latrova sees her doing that. He asks her if there is a problem or not, and she replies that there isn't anything. He then tells her that the place is this way, and after they reach the camping site, Vimishia continues to look at the people present and finds that there is a large gathering of adventurer teams from different places, so this place must expand to accommodate them. After that, the leader speaks to her, saying that this is their tent, the Blazing Swords tent, then he tells her that the piece of land next to them is vacant, so she can use it as she pleases. Then the leader speaks to the rest of his team, saying that they must leave as they will attend a meeting about the next steps in hunting the monsters leaving Latrova with Vimisha so he can do whatever she wants. Then we transition to Latrova with Vimisha, where there are lots of vegetables and meat in front of them. Vimisha asks if he will cook, and he replies that he will, although he's never been skilled at cooking. He always tries hard to cook something, but when the rest of the team tastes it, they never like the taste, so they get angry with him, making him scared of cooking. Vimisha asks him about the nature of the dishes he usually prepares. He answers that despite its appearance, he has a three-star fire attack skill, where he grills and roasts, burning everything in front of him, seasoning it with salt and pepper. So he asks her to help him prepare this dinner, and Vimisha agrees. Vimisha says, let's prepare wild rabbit meat together. We can use herbs to remove the gamey odor, rub it well with some salt for seasoning, then cut it into small pieces and shallow fry it. We'll also chop the vegetables and cook them in a pan with the meat, adding some herbs for aroma and flavor. 
Then we'll take some mutton and add some moderate spicy herbs and fry until browned and ready. Latrova is very impressed by Vimisha's cooking skills. After that, they eat the food. Vimisha hopes they like it. The leader invites them to start eating, and they thank her for the food, their faces changing. Then Vimisha becomes sad, asking if they didn't like the food. Chevalier speaks up, holding this dish, and smells it. He says it's wild rabbit, but he doesn't smell any foul odor. Noga says it's fragrant, and he didn't know food could be cooked like this. Vimisha then explains about a dish with aromatic tree leaves cooked at high heat, which helps remove the gamey odor from the meat. Then she thinks to herself, if people in this area don't use herbs, then Mila comes in saying what a beautiful smell. It's so strange to see the blazing swords enjoying a decent meal. Latrova tells her she came at the perfect time. Vimisha brought a beautiful meal. Mila becomes very happy and goes to join them. She tastes the food and is amazed by it. The leader says it's very delicious. The cooking is perfect, and the aroma is delightful. Vimisha tells them she's very glad they liked the food. Chevalier says that since Latrova was tasked with cooking duty. He was worried about our dinner tonight, but thanks to her, they enjoyed it. Then Latrova asks if Vimisha cooked all this food, and she replies, Mr. Latrova and I prepared it together. He skillfully controlled the fire for me, so the results were commendable. Mr. Latrova then tells them that fire control is ultimately his specialty. He then lights a torch and throws it into the sky, causing fireworks to happen, delighting everyone. Vimisha tells them they have a variety of metals, so they can create more beautiful fires using these materials, which include scraps and shards of iron, copper, tin, decorative stones, and other equipment. Vimisha is very happy about this, but Mira asks her what she will do with all these pieces. Vimisha explains that, for example, if they take this decorative stone and add this wild rabbit bone and some salt, then tie them together like this. She then asks Mr. Latrova if he can launch these upwards and burn them the way he did before. He does so and beautiful lights, like fireworks of different colors, emerge from them. This process is repeated several times and the sky lights up with fireworks. Afterwards, everyone finishes their meal, having indulged in eating too much because the food was so delicious. Then the leader, Selk, comes and orders Vimisha to go and rest because she prepared all this delicious food for them. He tells her that they will take care of the cleaning. Vimishia insists that she will also clean the dishes because she managed to celebrate thanks to them, and she wants to thank them for saving her from the ogre. The leader agrees to clean the dishes together. Suddenly, we see Mr. Latrova deeply affected by Vimisha. He tells her, you're very cute. I wish I had a little child like you. Then he hugs her, but everyone stops him and moves him away from her because he's strong and might hurt her with his powerful body. After that, she enters her tent and apologizes to Sora for being late. She gives him his special dinner, and Sora is very happy and starts eating. Vimisha says to herself, today was tough in every way, and those people surprised me at first. I'm glad they're good people. Good night. On the other hand, we see Chevalier with black hair saying, this boy is still very young. I'm amazed by his ability to travel all this distance alone. They imagine him as a boy, not a girl. Noga, the strong one with red hair, notices that the boy didn't eat well as he looks very thin. They all love this child. The leader, Selk, says that child is very cute with others. It's the worried look on his face when I asked him to rest in his expression of happiness. When I asked him to help me clean seemed as if he had in mind that if he wasn't useful, he would be thrown aside, but there's nothing we can do about that, really. On another side, we see Vimisha and Sora sleeping deeply, blissfully happy. And with that, our episode ends today. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes, but we kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button to receive all the latest updates. Our episode today starts with Vimisha in this place, which contains many old potions. She reaches out and takes many of them to feed Sora. While she's doing so, she notices some gelatinous beings moving around the place, which surprises Vimisha. She asks, are there tamers in this place like me at this time? Then Mila enters, accompanied by two extremely rare gelatins that can devour swords as well. They came to this place to get rid of garbage. Vimisha stands up from her seat and says, they are truly rare. Mila informs her, Yes, tamers who can control rare gelatins enjoy a high social status, so I have many connections even among important people. Vimisha then asks her, Have you ever seen a dispersed gelatin before? Malay replies that she hasn't seen anything like that, as it is indeed an extremely rare monster. If you manage to catch one alive, you can sell it for a huge amount. At that moment, Vimisha's body trembles, and she says, What is this presence that made her tremble and feel nauseous? It's the same presence she felt that time when something chased her, and she didn't know what it was. Mila asks her, what's wrong, Vimisha? But then the group enters, carrying many things. Latora informs them that dealing with those ogres was actually tougher than they expected. Their weapons trembled, and they consumed most of what they had. 
Then the leader raises his hand and informs them that they are returning home because they have successfully completed the mission. Vimisha is surprised by this news because she will return with them to her hometown. The scene then shifts to nighttime, where they are drinking mango juice. Vimisha, however, has prepared fresh shawarma for them, made from American beef, accompanied by potatoes and onions. She serves it to them and thanks them for their hard work, as they have killed all the monsters, which is a great accomplishment. They eat and rejoice as the food is truly delicious. Then she brings them this soup, which is a kaku meat soup. The Tora tries it but finds it too hot. The leader informs them that this soup excites him a lot. Everyone eats and drinks, and Vimisha is greatly thanked for her amazing cooking skills. Then Vimisha looks behind her and sighs a little because the group has said that they have hunted all the monsters in the area, and she wonders if Chili is okay or not. She reassures herself that nothing bad has happened to him. If someone fights this kind of monster, it will cause a great commotion and they will know about it. So she hopes he is fine. Then the leader says to her, Vimisha, you have been cooking all this food, but have you eaten and nourished yourself well too? Vimisha stands up from her seat and says to them, Yes, I have eaten a big meal just now. Then Shivali tells her, You're lying. You haven't eaten yet, so you must eat more to be able to survive in this tough life. Then Miss Myla comes and thanks everyone for their achievement, but the leader tells her, And you too, Myla, you did well. Myla starts to get to know Vimisha and tells her, These are my two older brothers, Toltu and Mama. They are the three of them form a group of adventurers called the Green Storm. The twins approach Vimisha, knowing she is very smart, but Vimisha tells them, No, I'm not that smart. However, the twins smile at her and tell her, When we saw you, Vimisha, we wanted to join you to our group, but Latoro approaches Vimisha, hugs her, and tells them, You can't because she's with us. So then the leader hits Latoro on the head and tells him to calm down, then they leave. Vimisha bids them farewell, but as they do, another group led by Commander Barolda enters. This is the group of adventurers known as the Thunder King, which caused the Green Storm to flee. Commander Barolda approaches them and asks about the child they mentioned earlier. They tell him that he is indeed very smart and has experience in many things. Then Commander Barolda instructs Zelik to accompany Vimisha to Arolu, and they agree to do so and safely escort her to her hometown. Hours later, Vimisha enters her home and apologizes to Sora for being late. She tells her to lower her voice because the adventurers are nearby. Sora then presents her with the bird she loves, and Sora starts to suck on it. And at that moment, the same presence as before comes to Vimisha. Not only that, but the candle starts moving, indicating a very dangerous situation. Sora quickly jumps into the bag, and Vimisha trembles in fear. But suddenly, the fear dissipates, and the presence disappears. She then hides the geel in her bag because she's afraid of something approaching her. She doesn't know what this thing is, but suddenly the feeling disappears. Then Mr. Latora appears and asks her if she's awake or not. She tells him that she's already awake, so he begs her to help him prepare breakfast for tomorrow as he doesn't want to do it alone. Vimisha agrees to help, which makes Latora very happy. He decides to go and inform everyone else. Then Vimisha enters her room and keeps wondering about that hidden presence that appeared and disappeared suddenly, especially since Mr. Latora appeared right after that presence. She assumes that Mr. Trotters. Latora is the source of that presence, but the gel disagrees with her opinion. However, Vimisha never blames him as she doesn't possess the power to understand him through it. She wishes she could be like Miss Mila, who is a tamer and has stars that can understand what the gel says. The gel remains very scared and Vimisha can't comprehend it. She recalls how the person who drinks alcohol and those killers behaved similarly in fear to the gel. Then she asks the gel about Mr. Latora, and it doesn't fear him. She asks about the rest of the team, and it doesn't fear them either, except when she mentions Miss Myla's name. It trembles in fear again. Vimisha understands that there's something unsettling about Miss Myla. The next day, we see Vimisha strolling in the city of Atalu. She goes to the guild where the clerk tells her that since it's her first time in the city, she must fill out this form. When Vimisha looks at the form, she finds that they ask for her name, hometown, and purpose. She asks the clerk if she needs to mention her hometown, and he senses that there's a problem, so he asks her about her hometown. She tells him she's from the village of Latomi. The clerk understands why she's hesitant to mention her village's name. Then he asks if she has a sponsor here, and she tells him she's sponsored by the village guardian, Oguto, as when she opened her account at the Merchant Guild, he was her sponsor. The clerk asks her for proof, so she shows him the white stone. He asks if he can touch the stone on the table, and when Vimisha allows it, the clerk finds that the stone story is indeed very true and there are no issues with it. 
He tells her that since Agato is her sponsor. There's no need to mention her hometown. She only needs to write her name and purpose. Then he gives her the license she'll need when entering and leaving the city. Bamisha thanks him profusely for his assistance and continues her tour of Atalu, marveling at its beauty. Latora asks her if this is her first visit to such a large town, and she confirms it's indeed her first time. So, Latora decides before doing anything else, he must provide her with a place to sleep. And indeed, they go to that tent where everyone helps in raising it together. Then the leader asks Vimisha to speak with her about something, and at night, he informs her that there is danger lurking in this town and the surrounding forest. Vimisha becomes worried because she thought they had captured all the monsters in the area. He reassures her that the danger isn't from the monsters, but from the people. The leader explains that there's a very serious problem in Otolu where people are being kidnapped and sold as slaves by a criminal organization. The town guard located their hideout and raided it, but it seems the information leaked somehow, so the hideout was completely abandoned. People are being abducted, and there are no reports even about these crimes. Vimisha asks if she thinks this criminal organization will target her. The leader responds that they target children, saying that a child traveling alone is the ideal target for them. They decided to stay with her for this reason. The leader apologizes to her because she was informed of this troubling news immediately upon her arrival in the town. They will crush the organization no matter what it takes. Until then, she should avoid doing anything alone and continuing her journey alone would be very dangerous. The guards are watching everywhere. Selzak mentions that the organization operates very discreetly, hoping to find evidence to track them down and apprehend those behind it. Bimisha then reveals that she was attacked and everyone is surprised. She tells them that she was targeted by someone who chased her, and then this man used his magic to prevent anyone from hearing our conversation for a while. The leader explains that it's an earring, a magical tool that falls from a monster sometimes when defeated. It's very valuable, so they only use it in extreme necessity. The Shali asks, when was the last time she was targeted? She replies, it was before I met the suppression team. I was in the forest feeling a nauseating presence chasing me. But when a monster appeared nearby, it fled. Vishali asks if she's adept at detecting presence, and she answers yes because she lived alone in the forest. Then Vimisha continues, saying that on the day she defeated the monsters at the landfill site, as in the camp at night, a presence approached Vimisha's tent again but vanished suddenly. Later, Latroa was found outside her tent, expressing suspicion toward Selzik, asking if he was behind it. Latroa responded that he went to her to ask for her help in preparing breakfast. Bishali commented on feeling a nauseating aura emanating from him. Latroa told them he was not the one. Noga stated that regardless of whether Latroa was genuinely nauseating, his arrival might have prompted the presence to flee. As in Sistor Gustard, mentioning a significant problem. There is a member of the organization among the suppressions. Everyone was astonished and began questioning who it might be. Latroa denied any involvement. Then Shivali asked Vimisha if anything came to mind. She reluctantly revealed that Myla from the Green Storm came to mind. Latroa deemed it impossible. Selzik asked if she had any evidence. Vimisha pondered what to do if she told them that Sora informed her and remembered Mila's words about a valuable secret, Sora could be targeted. She then apologizes, saying, forget what I said. The scene shifts back to the tent, where Vimisha asks Sora what to do. Sora reassures her, indicating it's okay to tell them. Vimisha recalls the old woman's words about hidden destinies and the revelation of secrets causing people to lose trust. Vimisha contemplates whether to disclose the information or keep it to herself. In the morning, Vimisha exits her tent to find everyone gathered, discussing something. When they request her to prepare breakfast, Vimisha agrees, but they ask her to wait. They activate a charm to prevent anyone from overhearing them. The girl mim of distressing news. The girl Mila from the Green Storm, as Vimisha mentioned, indeed has a dark side. Shivali adds that it's not just Mila. Her older brothers are also involved. Latroa confirms they investigated Mila's movements and observed her negotiating with a caravan merchant secretly. As soon as the merchant left, they confronted the trio. They admitted to meeting him coincidentally and indicated he was lost, denying any acquaintance with him. Latroa then reveals that while Malai and the others were speaking, they were consistently using the magical charm to block sound a valuable magical tool they rarely use for directions only. The leader, Beralda, concludes that their secretive discussion prompted its use. However, there's no evidence linking the Green Storm to any significant deal. Shivali shares that when he inquired about the wandering merchant at the Merchant Guild, he learned it was his first visit, 
and there were no suspicious activities reported. Baroda remarks this alone raises suspicion. Shivali emphasizes that the merchant is from another country, uses expensive tools, and has no visible occupation. Baroda suggests that if the merchant has goods he doesn't want others to know about, it aligns with their suspicions. A yellow-haired member interjects, suggesting their discussion is speculative and instinctual. However, Latroa counters that when circumstantial evidence accumulates, it can't be dismissed as coincidence. Latroa refuses to believe that Myla and her brothers could be involved, a sentiment echoed by his friend. The bald man also agrees with Latroa. And the commander apologizes and informs them that this is the truth, and it's an important thread leading us to the organization. The commander acknowledges that thanks to the information provided by Vimisha, they have taken a significant step. He confirms that all credit goes to her because she informed them about Myla's suspicious behavior. Everyone thanks her for this information because it led to uncovering the truth about Mila. Bimisha is surprised that they believed her, despite not telling them why Malai was suspicious, but they trusted her. The commander tells Vimisha that her valid reason behind her actions was more than enough. Stra asks Vimisha why she makes the food so delicious when she prepares it, and she responds that she wants them to enjoy the food they eat. Latora acknowledges that they know she is not someone who lies to them, and that's why they trust her. Bimisha thinks to herself that she hates lying in front of everyone, yet they still trust her. She then informs them that she is actually a tamer, and the one who informed her about Mila was her pet slime Sora. Everyone is surprised to learn that slimes possess this ability, and Vimisha explains that Sora is a rare slime with unique abilities. She then retrieves Sora from her bag, astonishing everyone because they've never seen a transparent slime before. Vimisha tells them that it seems to be called the Dissolving Slime, and although she doesn't know why, it seems to have the ability to detect evil individuals. The commanders agree that they must keep this secret, or else things could worsen if the villains learn about it. They tell Latora not to reveal this secret no matter what. Sora's thrilled, and all the members are delighted because it's an adorable slime. Vimisha tells them that Sora is her friend, and she informed them because they were kind enough to trust her. With that, our episode ends. Stay tuned for future episodes, and please subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button to receive all updates. Vimisha made a difficult decision to inform the herd about Sora which was very hard for her because she was afraid that this information might be leaked to others who would then take Sora and steal her from them. But what will happen? Follow the end to know everything. Spear's story begins when the herd was observing Sora, utterly amazed. This was a rare gelatin they hadn't seen before. The leader then tells them that he had been adventuring for a long time and had never encountered gelatin like this before. Approaching it, one of them touches it with his hand, finding it very charming and soft. He remarks, have you seen this? It's truly a magnificent piece of art. Then the one-eyed boy speaks up saying, I've only heard of translucent gelatins and myths and stories. This is the first time I've heard of one with the ability to sense evil. While playing with Sora, Rickfelt notices her discomfort and pulls his friend away saying, that's enough. Let's go. They then take him away and hit him hard because he has a weakness for cute animals, but also he dislikes them because he plays with them excessively. Vimisha smiles at this. They discuss how this rare gelatin has been tamed, a testament to Vimisha's remarkable taming skills and her ability to do many things. At this moment, Rickfelt wants to try it out, so he tells Sora, I am Latura from the tribe of the Flaming Sword, which disturbs Sora and makes his body shiver. This means he can detect lies because this man isn't Latura but Rickfelt. However, his friends tell him otherwise, suggesting that it's an expression of his hatred towards him. Rickfelt then defends himself, saying, Don't say that. I am a good man, and everyone loves me. Then the broad-mustached man with yellow hair says he wants to try this out. He tells Sora my name is Malric, causing Sora to shiver again, implying that his name is incorrect. He then tells them, Yes, my real name is Lokrik, and the one behind me is called Marlik, and Sora nods in agreement. Rickfelt approaches him again, as he likes him very much. The scene shifts after several hours while they were eating, and one of them says, I never imagined that the three from the Green Storm would be traitors. For a long time in that village, kidnappings were carried out by a slave trade organization and we couldn't find any information about them. Even when we got close, they would quickly evade us. Shivali said to them, This means there were traitors leaking our plans to the org, but thanks to God. And then with Vimisha's help, we now know that Mila, Toltu, and Malma are the traitors. Then the leader, Sislak, 
says if we manage to capture the Green Storm, it should be easier for us to act from now on so they don't escape. Then they look at Vimisha and find her sad. So Latora asks her, does it pain you to consider Myla as a bad person? She looked at him and said yes. Latora replied, I feel the same way. We have been friends since childhood. Then the leader looks at Rickfelt and says to him, Rick, you are also friends with Moma. If this pains you, you can withdraw from this matter, Rick replied. No, Malma is my friend. I want to apprehend him myself. In those moments, the leader encourages him, pats his back and says, That's true courage, Rick. Then Vamisha asks them, When did this organization start committing these evil acts? The leader tells her, This began ten years ago. People used to believe children went missing because they fell victim to monsters. But seven years ago, we confirmed the existence of an organization responsible for these acts when some victims sought refuge under our protection. They did something so atrocious that they called out to us and sought our help. The Misha ponders over the matter. In this case, there may be other traitors. If the organization has been active for such a long time, then I believe there are other traitors, and many of them as well. So I don't think it's just one team of traitors, Vimisha said. Commander Sezlak agreed, saying, You're right, and your words are true. Then he asks her, Do you remember how we informed you about the failed raid? She replied, Yes, you found their hideout and the guards raided it. But the information had leaked somehow, he asked her. How is that possible? The location was very remote, and the hideout was completely abandoned. The ally of the guards who had infiltrated the organization was killed. Only a few people knew the details. The Green Storm didn't know until shortly before it happened. This means that the possibility of other traitors is very, the commander said. This is a big problem. The Green Storm was endorsed by a member of the noble class, so they trusted them a lot. Bimisha is astonished by this and asks, are the noble and the Green Storm close friends? The commander replies, no, it seems the Green Storm solved a problem that the noble was facing, which led the noble to recommend their promotion to high-level adventurers. Then she asks him another question. Do members of the noble class usually recommend the promotion of adventurers? He tells her, no, this is unusual. Then she asks him another question. How much work did the Green Storm team accomplish for that noble to recommend their promotion? He tells her, as far as I remember, there was only one task. On that note, the noble once requested a task from us, the Flaming Sword once. The Lightning King's team was also requested for a task once, but it was just for one time. Vimisha tells them. She then informs them that the noble uses these questions to see if they would become allies or not, making everyone wonder why they hadn't noticed this before. Then everyone wishes her a happy birthday. Vimisha is surprised by this and thanks them. Her friend tells her that next time they'll celebrate her with a proper party. Vimisha thanks him for that and tells him that the celebration was wonderful and enough. She speaks to herself, saying that no one has wished her a happy birthday in years. Her friend asks her how a child her age knows all this about cooking, and she tells them it's because of her previous life. The team leader says if there's a traitor in the ranks of the noble class, it complicates things further, and they must be prepared to face the consequences. One of the team members asks Vimisha to help them think about who they should inform about this, implying that he suspects there are many traitors and wants to inform the guild leader and provide a report on the traitors and those who helped find them. Vimisha asks if they can trust the guild leader, and he tells her they will investigate to see if they can trust him or not. Then the scene shifts to Vimisha and the adventurers entering the guild hall and standing before the guild leader. Roglief, Vimisha tells him that she's pleased to meet him. Then we see the leader of the guards, Barksby, introducing himself, followed by the deputy leader, Agru. Is the leader of the adventurers. Lenz steps forward and tries to ascertain if everyone is all right. The guild leader asks what he, what he means, and the leader of the adventurers explains that the lens is a magical tool borrowed from Ivy, which allows the user to discern whether the person they're speaking with is good or evil. The fact that the lens didn't respond means that everyone in the room is all right. The guild leader asks Vimisha where she found it, and she tells him she found it in the forest during her travels. However, once it's used, it turns into an ordinary stone after about a week. The guild leader realizes they don't have much time and asks them to uncover the members of the organization. He also wants to find the traitor who leaked information about the guild and the adventurers. The leader of the adventurers assures him that this is their intention, and they've come to him for assistance. The guild leader orders all the adventurers to be brought in for testing. The scene then shifts to Ivy, the adventurers, and the guards arriving at the merchant's house, 
which the organization used as their base. <laughs> One of the adventurers informs them that when they demolished it, it was abandoned. The guard tells them that guards have been placed on the house during the investigation, but it's strange that they haven't found any leads yet. They approach the guards of the house and the leader of the guards begins to introduce Ivy and the guards, whose names are Zakayas and Maljajula, welcoming Vimisha introduces herself to them and Latroa speaks with his friend, Malgajula, mentioning that it's been a long time since he last saw him around. Maljula replies that he's indeed been searching for evidence all this time, but hasn't found anything. They will be searching the house today as well, and Latroa wishes them luck in their work. Then everyone enters the house and they complain to Maljula, blaming him as they summoned all the guards and they will gather here soon. They call for a search of every room, and Vimisha agrees to it. Everyone stays in the house until dusk to search for the traitors within the organization. Latroa sits next to Vimisha and tells her that she did well in this task. Vimisha responds, very tense, saying she never imagined that merely introducing herself would be so exhausting. Meanwhile, Barksby sits with the group leader and tells him that there are 38 traitors among the 157 guards. Barksby is shocked by this revelation as he never believed such a large number of spies could be within the guard. It's no wonder the organization <laughs> slips away whenever they find evidence. Every move they make leaks. Therefore, they can't afford any reckless actions. At this moment, Count Valentoria and Mr. Ferranda enter to inquire about any news or developments. The group leader fears and asks if something happened or not. Count Valentoria explains that he happened to be nearby and decided to come here to inspect the site, accompanied by Mr. Ferranda. The group leader introduces them to Vimisha, explaining that she was targeted by the organization, so they placed her under their protection. The Count recognizes her and wishes her a pleasant journey. The gal in Vimisha's bag is very afraid of this man, so she holds onto the leader's hand tightly, making him understand that the Count is a traitor. Then the Count speaks, saying if they found anything, they must inform him immediately. Then they look forward to hearing good news before leaving to go about their work. The leader speaks, saying that Count Valentoria is the hero of this town, but unfortunately, he is also guilty. Barksby doesn't believe him at first because there are traitors among the nobles as well. The leader tells him that Vimisha suspected this, so he wasn't surprised. If Count Valentoria is part of the organization, he likely controls it or is closely associated with it. If so, then all the threads are likely interconnected. This saddens Barksby greatly because he's the one who gave the Count that information. The leader asks him not to blame himself. It's not his fault. The members of the organization are the ones they should hate. The leader then asks Vimisha if there's anything else she noticed. She responds that the time between their arrival here and Count Valentoria's arrival was very short. If the Count is a member of the organization, she doesn't think it was a coincidence. Barksby adds that the traitors among the guards didn't leave their posts. The leader speculates that someone from the organization might be hiding near this base to continue monitoring it. Barksby is astonished, saying, So you mean this entire town is filled with enemies? As the leader responds, it's better to consider all possibilities. Latroa remarks that they couldn't find any evidence. They must have cleared everything before the raid. The leader assures him that there wouldn't have been enough time to remove evidence before the raid, as they have guards within their ranks who also guard, so traitors wouldn't be able to remove anything secretly. Then the elder asks, did anyone find anything? Guards were summoned for questioning. Vimisha asks, where did Malgajula search just now? And learns that he received orders from the organization to maneuver behind the scenes. It seemed like there were no problems in the rooms he was responsible for. Latroa is surprised by Vimisha's thoughts, saying, Are you sure you're only nine? I don't think a nine-year-old would think this way. The elder suggests they go to the room Malgajula was responsible for. They might find something there. The scene transitions as they head to the room. Barksby tells the guard that room doesn't need to be searched anymore. It's unlikely we'll find anything now. Go and search somewhere else and take some men with you. They enter the room and begin searching. Barksby says we'll search for anything that could be a lead. Sislik hands him a list of names of organization members or records of financial transactions. Latroa remarks that even if he reads these numbers, he wouldn't understand their meaning. Bimisha thinks to herself this is the only book with the corner of the cover frayed. That means this spot has been touched many times. She takes the chair and moves to see the book, but the door suddenly opens, startling her. Everyone is amazed by what Vimisha did as they enter and see all the boxes, which they open to find a large amount of gold. 
Fritz is leak says, this is a sum beyond imagination. The leader of the Adventurers Guild says this means that this organization is much larger than we imagined. One of the team members says, this isn't a sum that can be moved quickly. It likely means they left it here and fled. The leader of the guards reads the records in his hand and finds that they are records of the organization's transactions. One member of the team says it's evidence of kidnapping operations, and they might be able to tighten the noose on those involved. Bemisha tells them that the organization warned people around the building to guard these things. The leader of the guards, Barksby, orders them to leave everything as it is. I want the organization to think we didn't find this hideout. Put everything back in its place and withdraw immediately. As dawn approaches, the entire team gathers, realizing that this situation is bigger than they expected. Noga tells them that the guildmaster, their team leader, and the leader of the guards have all been holding secret meetings because there are a huge number of traitors among them. Another member of the team says they don't want the organization to notice, so they can't act openly, Latora says, but thanks to your effort. We can see clearly now, and we'll catch everyone in the organization, no matter the cost. Shivali responds, the problem is, when we do that, we'll all be at risk. Femisha, please be careful not to do anything alone. If there's anywhere you want to go, let us know, and we'll go with you. Femisha thanks them profusely and informs them that she has one favor to ask from another side. We see Femisha happily filling a basin with water, pleased because it will make laundry much easier. She tells Latora that it's a magical tool placed in laundry areas for those who can't use water magic. There are many who can't use water magic, just as there are many who can't use cleaning magic or create fire. Latora mentions that he also can't use water magic and Shivali found a water magical tool for him which he uses when cooking. Femisha comments that Mr. Shivali is very kind, to which Latora agrees, advising Femisha not to anger him. Suddenly, the traitorous girl, Malila, enters, asking Femisha if she's adapted well to Autolua. Femisha confirms, describing it as a very big and wonderful village. Mila suggests exploring entertaining places together and mentions a sweet shop she knows. She invites them to go with her, but Femisha can't say anything. Knowing that Myla is a traitor who kidnaps children, the Torah intervenes, saying he likes the idea and suggests going to eat sweets. Amila gets angry, revealing that she had invited them to go to Mararoko. The Torah had suggested going to Flau Flo, and eventually Myla agrees, suggesting they all go together. They decide to go with the five of them, surprising the Torah and Femisha. Suddenly, two other people emerge, likely from the treacherous gang, plotting to take Femisha and get rid of the Torah. How will they deal with them? Will the rest of the team discover this? We'll find out in the next episode, so stay tuned. But please subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button to receive all updates. Your episode today begins when Vimaikia and her friend went to Latora along with Mila to the Flau Flu restaurant. The cook welcomed them warmly, thanking them for waiting and pointing out that the dish he had with him was their latest creation. He encouraged them to take their time and enjoy it as much as they wished. Everyone began eating quickly, savoring the deliciousness of the food. Then they wanted to order another dish. The brothers spoke up, saying they came here because Mila told them that Ivy is a very good guy, which sparked their curiosity about him, so they decided to invite him to hang out with them. They then asked the cook for another dish in a brutish manner. Mila told them to stop intimidating Ivy, warning that they would only push him away by behaving like that. She looked at Ivy and said, Isn't that right? They knew he was a boy, or so they believed. In reality, however, she was a girl named Vimicia. Then we turn to Sora, who describes them as very dangerous people. Latora then draws his sword and warns them that whoever bothers Vimicia, he will kill them with his sword. The other person tells him to stop joking, as they wouldn't fight someone with a fire attack skill with three stars acknowledging Latora's superiority. They tell him to be a bit more lenient with them. In their conversation, Latora mentions that Lemon is correct, but he lacks defensive skills akin to being naked in battle. One of the brothers suggests following Mila's lead, as it might be a test of valor to see who is the strongest. Mila screams at them, telling them to stop and that they are uncivilized. She questions why people who possess combat skills always behave like this. One of them tells her she wouldn't understand because she only has the taming skill, and the situation would be different if she could tame stronger beasts. Three, but you tame Gelamites and they are very weak. The most you can do is dispose of waste. You're not capable of defeating powerful beasts and earning a lot of money? Mila feels very saddened by herself. Then Vamikia stands up and says, I find that remarkable. She asks if she tames them with two stars or not. 
The other girl confirms, yes. Mimicia looks at her and says that in itself is remarkable. But for Stahl and Lidl, they are rare Gallimites who can get rid of weapons and leave behind a lot of waste. During my travels alone, I benefited from various waste dumps. When I find something that seems usable, though it has been discarded, I pick it up and make use of it. So I know for certain that when some people throw away certain things, it doesn't mean anything to them, but there are others for whom it means a lot. Mila thanks her for her wonderful words. Then Latora tells her, taming is an excellent job. It can help others, and if you bond with your Galmites, you can rely on them as friends. The scene shifts as Vimikia and Latora leave the restaurant. Chatora asks her, how did you find them, Vimikia? She tells him that Sora says they are not good all the time. Mr. Magma and Mr. Tolto, too. This angers Latora, and he tells her, I didn't mean that. I meant the desserts at Flu Flu. Mimicia tells him they were very beautiful. Then Latora stops and tells her the person who runs that store was an adventurer. He's no one can touch us there. That's why I was secretive about going to that place, because I didn't know what they were planning. So I wanted to avoid going to the place they suggested. If they put drugs or something in the food, it would be extremely dangerous. Latora apologizes to her and says, You're right. I didn't consider that possibility to that extent, but it's a definite possibility. This means that all of the Green Storm team's betrayal has been confirmed. Vimikia said, Knowing people who don't want good and don't intend good is truly saddening. I only love kind people, she added. Stwisil Latora agreed, saying, You're right. When I was younger, children could roam this town freely. When we did good deeds, adults praised us, and when they saw us doing bad deeds, they scolded and punished us. Everything was enjoyable, with its ups and downs. The Mishia reflected to herself that it was the same for her when she was young, not even five years old. Stwisilter Latora then told her, But now it's very dangerous. When a child goes out, they should be accompanied by an adult to protect them from the wicked enemies. Children are dependent on adults. The town is uncomfortable and restricted, severely so. It's very dangerous. I want to restore the peace the town once enjoyed. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to the group holding a meeting in the presence of Ivy, and they were using that magical tool so no one could hear them. The leader, Cesaric, spoke up, saying the Green Storm has come to kidnap Vimikia. Latora informed him that they weren't that clear about the matter. They came to invite her just to have desserts with them, but there are many doubts about this, he added. Then the leader told them that they have the audacity to do something like this in broad daylight, meaning they could carry out the kidnapping without anyone seeing them. They must still believe that no one knows they're traitors. One of those present asked, Do why does the green storm go to all this trouble just to target Vimikia? Trisotora responded, That's to capture Ivy and sell him. Noga replied, telling him that Ivy is protected by them, as they are members of the Fiery Sword Group and the Lightning King Group. Targeting him is considered a challenge to them. Cesaric intervened, saying that even if they succeeded in kidnapping him, they would risk putting the Green Storm under suspicion. Despite all these difficulties, Vimicia spoke up, saying, If the Green Storm is a taste, then it won't be a problem for the organization to be exposed as traitors. In fact, spreading news of traitors' existence would logically make them do suspicious acts, shocking Rick Flit with her words. Mimicia continued, stating that if there were traitors, it would be difficult for the guards and adventurers to do anything because they wouldn't know where the information is leaking from. Rick Flit responded that she was right, even when they raided their base. They had already left a long time ago because they somehow knew they were coming, which was meaningless except that only their top officials can deal with important information making it difficult to draw plans. Tatastans and Samarik stated that the organization would want to retrieve the money and documents they left at the base. So after restricting their movements, they would likely set another trap for them. His friend replied that traders would remain wanted criminals throughout the country, no matter how much they were paid, and Mila and the others wouldn't be able to continue as adventurers. Trietel interrupting them. Bemikia said the basilisk sheds its tail. They didn't understand the term basilisk, nor did they possess basilisks in this world. Mimicia explained that the organization might see Mila and the others as sacrificial pawns, and in that case, once their role is completed as bait, they would likely be hidden so they don't reveal anything. Tractor Slatora was afraid and said they must inform Mila of this, but Cesaric interrupted him, telling him they can't let them know what they're up to. Tuatora asked what they should do, but Cesaric didn't respond. However, Vimikia answered, telling them that she would be the bait. She could mislead the Green Storm by providing the organization with false information. For example, they could say that the guards at the base would be reduced. 
If the organization believed this information and came to retrieve the money and documents, they could then ambush them and apprehend them. The leader was surprised by her words, finding it hard to believe she was still only nine years old. Her plan was very convincing, but he couldn't agree to it. He couldn't expose her to danger. Shivali stated that if they fought against the organization, it would lead to a full-scale war. However, there are many traitors embedded among the guards and adventurers, and given the situation, they wouldn't be able to ensure Vamikia's protection. Latora responded, saying he would protect her and keep her safe no matter what happens. Then Vamikia spoke, saying that whether she acted as bait or not, she would still be at risk due to the targeting. If proven true, they should shorten the time for her to act as bait, making it easier to protect her and apprehend the criminals. The leader was convinced by her words and asked them to start spreading false information, inviting them to attack their old base. They would set up an ambush there to apprehend them all at once. Trope Crow said, Rekfuit replied that they don't know how many traitors are among them, putting them in an awkward position. If they were attacked from behind by those they considered allies, they wouldn't stand a chance, but if they informed people about the traitors and the organization knew their plan, everything would fail. They never know what they would do. Vimikia then told them that when the special unit is raided and tear gas is used, it will be a signal. Vimikia told them that when the special unit is raided, they should use tear gas. The leader was surprised, asking her what tear gas bombs are. Vimikia explained that it's a magical tool that can incapacitate and put the enemy to sleep. The leader responded that it would be possible if they used the sleep ball, but it would affect both enemies and allies alike. Mimicia further explained that if both enemies and allies were put to sleep, there wouldn't be any casualties, and they could apologize to their allies. The old man expressed astonishment, questioning whether it was something a nine-year-old would think of, but he acknowledged it as a good idea and said he couldn't make a decision. The major issue lies in Vimikia's hands. The leader agreed, stating that even if they acted upon it, they would need time to craft a solid plan. Vimikia mentioned that Sora was the one who informed her about the traitors, and the organization was unaware of this. Trade if they were to launch an attack, the opportune time would be now. The old man agreed, saying they were in a position that allowed them to take the initiative, meaning they shouldn't miss this opportunity. Three, they would devise a thorough plan and attack the organization. The leader emphasized that they wouldn't accept failure and urged them to ensure this information doesn't leak. They would start crafting their plan immediately. The leader thanked the adventurers for gathering and explained that he called them here to ask for a favor. Then, Vimikia introduced him, saying that some of them might recognize him because the Adventurer's Guild was tasked with protecting him. This was to show everyone in Ottawa and beyond that the town is safe, and he wanted everyone to get acquainted with each other. Each person went one by one to introduce themselves to Vimisha. Orgob asked the leader, Parksby, if he was all right, as he seemed different from usual. Parksby responded that he was just imagining things and that he was fine. Orgob then remarked that he could see that it was probably his imagination. The commander said, we have suffered from the organization's crimes for a long time until we started to feel exhausted repeatedly. We would besiege them, then they would escape, and with each time there were casualties weighing heavily on our hearts. Thoughts of surrender accumulated, burdening us, and Borolda feels the same way. Whenever he talks about the organization, his face darkens, but when he speaks of Ivy, he smiles. Thanks to her, it seems like the tides are about to change. That's the hope that haunts me. After that, Shivali called out to him, saying, we organized a special unit and we discovered a den of monsters in a cave in the forest. The commander replied, I thought the suppression squad had taken care of them, Shivali told him. It seems one of them escaped and hid there. We want to finish the matter once and for all, so we need to request a large group of members. We're facing a fierce adversary and there will be other risks at the same time, so choose the members accordingly. Then he said to Agrab, can I leave the selection of soldiers to you? Regarding the risks on the road, Agrib responded, It won't be a problem. I don't intend to let anyone slip away and leave. <laughs> Shivali said, We plan to do something amusing, which is why we came to invite you. After that, the scene shifted to the Adventurer's Guild. The commander said, Everyone has finished introducing themselves. I'll call you by name. Stay here. You'll be assigned an extremely secret mission. Then Vimikia said to Suar, You did a good job, and it seems like you still have a lot of energy. Then Miss Mila appears and tells Vimisha that she has suddenly become famous, thanking her for what happened yesterday, saying that what she was doing, disposing of waste, is an important task. Vimisha tells her that it's the truth, as there are dangerous things in the waste dumps that need to be dealt with. Then, 
Those soldiers appear, and one of them tells Vimisha that now that this large number of adventurers knows about her, she'll be safe and wherever they see her, they'll take care of her, so Vimisha won't be targeted anymore. Then the boy with orange hair offers Miss Myla to go together for sweets, and everyone agrees to that, suggesting they go to Mamoruko where the green sweet paste is the best. Then the scene shifts to those adventurers where Commander Barksby tells them that he doesn't understand what they mean, asking them to give him more details. The adventurer tells him that he doesn't know if there's anyone coordinating against them or not, so he can't tell him more details, as he wants to avoid them thinking they're sharing secrets, preparing themselves to fight them. Barksby tells him that he doesn't have any means to help them. Then suddenly that guard comes and tells him that Deputy Commander Agrob downstairs is gathering some guards and asks what they will do about the guard here and the commander tells him that they don't need strict guarding here. One of the adventurers tells him to reconsider as this place is still important to the organization, so they should leave some men here to protect the place. The commander agrees, and then he orders the guard Gobujula to choose the men who will stay here to protect the place and orders him to join the others in the special unit. Then one of the adventurers tells him that they have just started implementing the plan, and the one who devised the plan is Barolda and Sizalik will consult Ivy. Then Barksby asks him, what's the next plan? Tree, the adventurer who can induce sleep appears and tells him that when the enemy comes to seize this place, he will put them to sleep. Tree, the commander asks if the boy also thought of this, but Chevali doesn't respond and hurriedly leaves. Then one of the adventurers hands him a bag and the commander looks inside and asks if this is also made by Ivy. The adventurer tells him it's made by Chevali and it can be used against both enemies and allies. The adventurer explains that it depends on the commander and his abilities. Then the scene shifts to the courtyard, where we see the assembly of the special unit. Most of the men chosen by Gobujula for guard duty are traitors, so they must be using their allies as camouflage. Barksby wishes them luck and asks about the timing of the trap. The commander tells him that they will lure them far enough away to render them unable to harm the town, and if they attack, he will leave the rest to him. Then the scene transitions to Myla, Ivy, and their friends arriving at the location, where they hear rumors that just one sweet from this place is enough to make you lose consciousness. The Misha is surprised by the conversation, and everyone enters inside. We see Vamisha telling her friend that their operation is starting now, and thus our episode of this anime ends. To follow new episodes, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell. The episode begins with Vamisha and her friends at the restaurant. Mila suggests to them to order the Donzo dessert as it's the best dessert in the place. When Femisha agrees, her friend Latrova warns her not to do so as it's very dangerous. Just one bite could make her dizzy and lose consciousness. However, Mila assures her that everything will be fine and she will really enjoy the dessert. Then, the restaurant owner Hag comes and asks them what they would like to order. They all say they want the Danzo dessert. Hag then asks Latrova what he will order, and she tells him he will also order Danzo. Hag then leaves, visibly upset, and tells them he won't eat anything that dangerous as he loves sweets, but there are limits. He asks Hag to cancel the dessert, but Hag explains that their Danzo isn't overly sweet. It's very delicious, but the sweetness might bother him at first. Femisha notices that Sora seems very tense, and she remarks that she expected that as Mr. Hag is also a bad person. Then she grasps Latrova's hands and tells her that their operation will start now. Mila tells them she has wanted to bring them to this place for a while because the desserts are very delicious here. Latrova says she wished their first order had been more forgiving to beginners. Her friend tells her that everyone has a first experience and a man's start should be strong. Latrova tells them he loves sweets so everything will be fine. Then he reveals the real reason for inviting them out today. He wants them to help execute a secret mission from the Green Storm and ask something directly from the Union leader because he can't do it. He tells them this because he trusts them completely. Meanwhile, Hag is standing behind them trying to eavesdrop. Latrova tells them that a special unit of guards and adventurers has been gathered and is about to head into the forest. During their absence, security in the town will weaken, so he wants them to help maintain order. He asks his friends if this is the job the Union leader was preparing for, and he also asks what this large unit will fight to the extent that it leaves the town without guards. He informs them that Ogre and Ogre King have been spotted in a cave in the forest, which surprises everyone. Then we see Hag adding a liquid to the dessert, but we still don't know what it is. Mila informs them that the suppression squad has supposedly eliminated the Ogres, to the best of her knowledge. Latrova tells her that it's been discovered that some of them have escaped, and the plan is to launch a comprehensive attack while they're still in one place. 
That's why the special unit is being assembled to combat them. As the special unit spreads out in the forest, the town will be very vulnerable and it would be bad if the organization attacked during that time. Still, in reality, guards have been taken from the previous base of the organization, so if that place is attacked now, they won't be able to do anything about it. Then Hag arrives and offers them the dessert, explaining that this is why he asked for their help. Trova Trova tells them they can rely on them. If they go out on a guard patrol, no one will dare touch them. Meanwhile, as they talk, Hag goes outside. Femisha tells Mila that Hag heard their conversation and went outside. La Trova tells her he expected that, so the first phase is successfully completed. Then he asks everyone why they're joining the organization and how much they'll get paid for kidnapping Femisha. Mila and her brothers are surprised by his words and ask him what he's talking about because they don't know anything about it. He then offers them his and Femisha's special dessert and asks them to eat it, assuring them there's no need to hesitate unless there's something inside the dessert that shouldn't be eaten. It's his gift to them because they won't be able to eat sweets in jail. Then Mila tells her brothers that they should surrender because they've done enough terrible things and money isn't that important to this extent. Still, her brothers ask her if she will betray them. Latrova tells them they are the betrayers as they have betrayed the trust of the townspeople. The brothers draw their swords and prepare to attack Latrova, but Latrova tells them to put their swords aside as he doesn't want to kill them. However, Malma attacks Latrova, starting a fight between them. Latrova strikes him down and informs him that he didn't possess defensive skills, but he trained for it. Then he looks at Tolto and tells him that his defense might be stronger than his own defensive skill. Tolto attacks him and Latrova defeats him too. Then the fight ensues between Latrova and the brothers. When Latrova uses fire magic, Malma counters with water magic, nullifying Latrova's magic. Latrova then draws his sword and as the brothers are attacking, their sister Mila intervenes. She uses her spells Istal and Lydeal, summoning slime cards that stick to her brothers' swords and prevent them from fighting. Ogre then attacks them and knocks them down. Meanwhile, Femisha is sitting at the table extremely frightened. Latrova asks her if she's hurt, and she tells him she's fine. Then he looks at Mila and asks her if she's okay. She tells him she can no longer do those bad things and apologizes to them as she was deceived all this time. Femisha thanks Mila for her help, acknowledging that without her assistance they would have died. Suddenly, Malik Fluflu enters and asks them what happened here. Latrova tells him they will take the criminals from the place and asks him to help them carry them. Fluflu asks them what exactly happened here, and Femisha tells him they were used as bait in an attack against the organization. Latrova then tells them it's time for them to start the main part of the plan. The scene shifts to the palace, where we see masked members of the organization attacking and fighting the guards. Then we see one of the guards standing against two members of the organization, raising his hands. And he made a specific signal with his hand to the guard, and the guard completed the signal and then took him inside. After that, the man spoke to the guard, expressing his disbelief that the organization also had men within the guard. The guard replied that there was a hidden room in the library on the third floor. So one of the traders went to the room, asked his friend to accompany the count inside. Then these two guards appeared where they had been hiding in this place because they were afraid of what was happening and didn't know what they would do. The guard spoke to his friend that they must inform their allies. But they didn't know who stood with them, as they faced many troubles when the leader was not with them. Afterward, the Count and his assistant went to the hidden room where they met their men and informed them that they had done well. This hidden room contained money and documents for safekeeping and protection, while this special unit, or whatever it was, was heading towards the forest. Then he ordered them to empty the contents of the room. Then he opened this hidden room with this secret key, and when it was opened, the Count and his men entered. But soon the alarm system was activated, and then a bomb containing a sedative gas was activated. When any person smelled it, they would instantly fall asleep. So, all the men plugged their noses to avoid inhaling the smoke, but they couldn't do so for long and were immediately sedated. After that, the Count and his men realized that this was a trap for them, and they also fell asleep instantly. Afterward, we see the commander, Parksby, and his men heading towards the Count's location. Parksby speaks to his assistant, saying that he now understands the meaning of the phrase, take it in stride. This assistant replies that he also understands, but the men behind them are also trying to take them in stride. So Parksby tells him that they were taken in stride by the same person who took them, and he was a nine-year-old child. So then Seslick speaks to his commander, expressing sympathy for Parksby as he never expected such a turn of events. 
The day to rid themselves of years of frustration and resentment has finally come, and all credit goes to the child IVA, so they must thank him and let go here. Then we return once again to Commander Parksby, who is very interested in what is happening. He sees no harm in enjoying the situation, but they cannot accept failure. He doesn't want any mistakes here. Then he gave him this thing, and the guard was shocked because the child Evie had also thought of this. The commander replied that Ivy didn't think of it, but Chevalier doubted it. This calmed the guard, for he would have been shocked if the child had thought of something as disturbing as this, but it suits the fools behind them well. So it seems they have decided to take charge now. They must have done this to avoid witnesses, and to achieve this they must eliminate the strongest among them, so they might eliminate them first. So, Commander Parksby said that if they were suddenly attacked by this large number of men whom they considered allies, not even they would be able to stand against them. He is not Avi, but nevertheless, he will seize the opportunity to use a hostile plan against them. Parksby told Agrub to get ready to reply, and this knight struck an arrow at Parksby, but Agrub intercepted it, then attacked them, placed the net, and imprisoned them. For this knight fears, so the old man told him not to worry. He is innocent, but these are traitors who helped us catch the people they mentioned and arrested them. Agrub said to arrest all the traitors. Parksby told them that the purpose of this evidence is to arrest the huge monsters. It is infused with powerful magic that suppresses physical strength and they cannot escape. The knight asked Parksby what to do. Parksby replied, saying that they have investigated all of them and they are traitors. The knight told him not to say that because it's not true. Parksby told him to look at the men around him. They are all members of the organization. Then Agrub told those who conspired with the organization to learn this lesson. Then he used his magic on them and tortured them. The knight said this is a misunderstanding. He didn't do anything. Parksby said it's hard to target just the traitors. We are grateful for your help in catching them. After that, the scene shifts to the guild. Parksby said they managed to safely capture all the traitors within the guard. The old man said the traitors were among the adventurers, and we caught them all, and all the credit goes to the plan he drew up. A group thanks Parksby, saying this is a huge accomplishment, and you saved this town because of you. Then Count Valtoya spoke while they were bound, saying to them, Do you know what you're doing? You're holding a noble, and you think you'll get away with this deed, Forander replied. You won't get away with this deed. The guildmaster has uncovered a plot and informed me about it. We're looking into various documents here, and your evil deeds will be exposed. I have sent an envoy to the royal capital informing them of the details of this case. I am sure you will be punished in due time. I advise you to be humble. The old man said, at the moment there will be riots and we see those people behind the gate shouting. Parksby goes to them and says, calm down everyone. As for years, Atowa has been a victim of the organization. We have caught the conspirators with them and exposed many traitors within the guard. Then guard commander Parksby tells the people, we have uncovered many traitors within the guard and among the adventurers as well. That's why I sincerely apologize. Everyone wants to know who the traitors are and to get them out immediately. Parksby apologizes to them because he cannot announce those who have been arrested yet because we haven't obtained conclusive evidence of their crimes yet. We ask you to wait until everything is announced. We want all of you to promise not to harm those we have arrested. But people are annoyed and say we will kill them and burn them alive. Parksby tells them that all the convicts will become slaves, but I am sure that few of you know where these slaves are sent, and the place they are sent to is a very harsh place. What awaits them is hard labor beyond anything you can imagine, and they won't even be able to choose death. They will be forced to continue working for the benefit of our world, and each day will be harsher than you can express in words. Hell itself will be easier. And if you kill them, their suffering will end here. But we will not allow that, and we will not release them from their suffering so easily because they are traitors and deserve everything that will happen to them. So I beg you, please do not harm them. The people agree to the commander's decision. We see Vamisha very impressed by Commander Parksby and his strength and influence on the people. He did that to prevent the inhabitants of the town from committing crimes. Then Latrova speaks while they are mesmerized. It's amazing how much you understand, Vamisha. Vimisha replies, if it weren't for the commander's speech, some of those people who were enraged would have gathered the prisoners. Chevalier adds, yes, and if any prisoner is killed during that, the victims will turn into criminals and the result will be tragic. That's why the commander bears full responsibility himself. Vimisha says, the commander is indeed amazing. Everyone is delighted with her, and Parksby tells her, you know, I've been telling myself that you're really amazing, Vimisha. She tells them that the commander is the amazing one, and she wants to be like him one day. Chevalier, surprised by her mature outlook, tells her it's too early to give up on her life. 
She's still very young and a bright future awaits her. Then Commander Parks becomes very angry and tells them not to plant strange ideas in Vamisha's head. Then he thanks Vamisha very much for all her support and tells her that none of this could have happened without her. Then the old team leader comes and tells her that it's time for the final touch. We have one last task for you, Vamisha. She is very happy about that. On the other hand, we see Commander Sezilok, who has summoned all the people for one reason, and he begins addressing them. He tells them that we are gathering information about the members of the organization whom we have arrested, and we request the assistance of all of you. Anyone who refuses to cooperate will be accused of colluding with the organization, so keep that in mind. Vimisha is surprised by the large number of people and by the fact that we will investigate all these people. The team leader tells her that, of course, all of them will be investigated as they were in the vicinity of the organization's base, and we will arrest anyone who was seen lurking around that area. Then Vimisha opens her bag and finds that Sora is very happy with this work. She says, well then, let's start revealing them. And with that, our episode ends. Stay tuned for the upcoming episodes with exciting events. I hope for your support on the channel by subscribing and activating the notification bell to receive all the latest updates.